Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode, I believe, 311 of the Xbox Two podcast on this uh, glorious 60 degree day Friday here in uh, Chicago, Illinois. I'm one of your hosts, Randall Thor19, the man with the million. And with me, I am with the one and only managing editor, Windows Central. Jazz freaking Corden. <laughs> I felt you, you. I felt like you forgot my name for a second. No, there. I was because I was, like, I, I was oh, thinking my, of a, that was a long. Pause. I was. I was in my mind. I had the tweet that oh, um, I, Jen Jen put up where where you said, "Hey, we're doing the Xbox Two today, but it's going to be an hour later." And then she had like a picture of Seth Rollins, but with your face on it, all like dressed up in his outfit. And basically, like, oh, Jez Corden, Jez freaking Corden coming in five minutes before the show, and Rand's been preparing for three hours or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> that's very uh, accurate. Jez freaking Corden here Jez for the show. Corden. Yeah, everyone's like, everyone I know has gone back into wrestling. You know, like all my all my friends are like, we all stopped watching it around being age 19, 20. And like all these, you know what they what they've been doing with the Rock and all this stuff. Everyone I know started watching it again. It's so so crazy. It's so it's the Rock, it's so cool. bro. It's the Rock. That's why. Rock. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the final the boss. Come on. The final boss. The Rock being heel so great, and he's he hasn't changed a bit. Like he still wrestles like as if he's still twenty years younger. The dude's so impressive, but. I haven't watched Day 2 yet, Rand. WrestleMania. I, yeah, I haven't watched Day I've, 2. I've gotten people DMing me being like, you need to convince Jazz to to finish it. You got a lot on your plate. To, you got you got the four need to hours. Finish my of, story. Yeah, yeah, you got that. You got Fallout. <laughs> you got a whole bunch of stuff you need to finish. Yeah, I do. I do. But uh been a busy week. Lots of things going on in the jazz world. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's uh we come we're definitely coming up to showcase season. I feel like um Yeah, you you put out a cryptic tweet about is, yeah. showcase Now, I had people DM me asking me what you were talking about with that tweet. And I don't know cuz you didn't tell me. I didn't ask also. But you didn't ask. Is it what's going on? What was that tweet all about, Jess? Well, <clears throat> You know, like during the pandemic, there was pretty much no travel. There was no travel. Sure, sure, yes. Lockdowns, planes grounded, E3 dead, all this kind of stuff. And I feel like last year, I feel like last year they experimented with, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do all these press events remote now. We're gonna stream the games over Discord. We're gonna do a lot a lot of these. Um, oh, what was it called now? We're gonna use Parsec to let people play the games remotely and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they they experimented that with that last year, but this year it's like they've been like, okay, the remote stuff doesn't work. Let's do press events again. And I'm doing more travel this year than I've probably ever done in my life. Mm. I've got like so many travel events. I'm traveling on Sunday, okay, and then I'm traveling to another. I'm traveling to several different countries in the space of two months to to cover all kinds of games for Xbox coming up. Uh, and PC, and it's just crazy. It's so exciting, and it's it's like the hype setting in for me again. The, you know the showcase season, and I'm hearing some great things about the showcase. Oh you my know, god, like, here we go! The hype has begun. The Jess Corden yeah, with they, the teasers and the hype, and I've heard they've got the the first the first draft oh. of the Xbox showcase. You know, and uh, it's it's sounding pretty pretty hype, bro. Mm. Pretty hype. Tom Henderson's probably in here furiously typing away Xbox. Uh, what, what would you title it? Xbox Showcase First Draft Finished, says Jez Corden of uh, Xbox Two and Windows Central. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been hearing some pretty exciting things. I mean, they've got a lot of studios now, a lot of studios doing all kinds of different things, which needs to be showcased, you know? Um, so it's going to I think it's going to be a great show even if you're not an Xbox fan there's going to be like there's going to be so much stuff in there for everyone mm. it's going to be a really big event it's going to be a so. huge event you think we you think we get uh 
two hour show finally like around that around that timeline because i know last year was so. like an hour for the main show but then 45 minutes for starfield which worked out pretty well because a lot of people consider that starfield deep dive one of the better deep dives into a game but you it know was good. you have all the xbox game studios who are should be close to ready i mean uh you know you got another look at like avowed and you know whatever like fable and south of midnight and contraband i mean you can probably name state of the k3 which is a game that you were teasing not to mention some of the yeah, bethesda man. stuff like i saw nate the hate said it should be ready whatever else there and and then the activision stuff so they could have a, a large event but i think sometimes they think the longer the event people sort of get antsy a little bit antsy and, 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 and kind of like we don't want it to be two hours because people kind of lose interest. But I think if something's really good, I, it's, as long as you're not going like three hours, like I think two hours is perfectly fine uh, for, well, for, I mean, you the, know, for a show. It's de- it's definitely going to be a balancing act. It's going to be like, because they've, they've got a very broad diversity of content to cover, you know, and there's probably going to be games that are PC exclusive and I know you're not interested in that. And they've got games like, you know, flight simulator, which again, very popular, but you don't want to hear about that. You always talk about like no flight simulator. No, yeah, they always end up online, no sea of thieves, no fallout, yeah. no fallout 76, you know, but they, they always these do are it. all games that have the huge fan bases. Like they announced, did they, did I imagine this, but did they announce that elder scrolls online is, like they've done some billions of dollars milestones or something recently. I don't know. I, uh, I know Colt was just in Amsterdam uh, for the Elder Scrolls Online thingamabob. Yeah, Colt was in Amsterdam. Yeah, Colt was there. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's awesome, dude. Can we? It's you know, awesome. we, we you know we we gotta call out. We gotta call out Paris. He's in the chat right now. He's ducking me and Jazz. You know, we got invited to X Cast. We thought we'd be hanging out with Paris alongside. Our guy, Snowbike Mike, but Paris is nowhere to be found. He's always ducking me when I come on these <laughs> shows. Always and forever. And now he's saying Rand should wait until the show is over to watch it so he can binge the highlights. More like, shouldn't you like watch the show in 15-minute increments and watch uh, like 15 minutes the first week and then wait a week to watch the second 15 minutes? <laughs> So you can get like the, f- so you can sit there and discuss it on Twitter and be like, I like to watch things week to week, guys. You know, oh, that's that's man. the best way. Shouldn't shouldn't you be watching highlights from one Friday to the next? Ah, uh, nah, I'm with Paris on this one, man. No, I mean, no, 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 no. If if they'd done Fallout week to week, then that could drag out the conversation. We could talk about each episode yeah. and the trend on Twitter but every week. But the thing is, nobody... But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Nobody actually discusses the show on Twitter, right? The, the Like, I know I know that is like, oh, it's, it's so much cool because you can discuss it on Twitter. But nobody really discusses it. All the tweets are... Uh, okay, so like if, if it was just like the first episode or the fifth episode, here's the discussion that happens on Twitter. Yo, just watch Fallout Episode 4. It was really good. Can't wait to watch next week. <laughs> that's it. That's the whole discussion. I, wh- wh- ah. I, that's it. That's all they say. It's like, just just watched it. Can't wait to watch next week. There's actually no discussion about character development or plot points or anything. It's just a way to be like, I can tweet about this uh, every Friday or whatever. <laughs> That's all. It's not, you are on, like, maybe on Reddit there might be some discussion about what's going on or something, but there ain't certainly any discussion going on X. You know? Mm. So, I don't want to hear that. We know what it is about. It's about keeping people subscribed longer. Oh, you want to watch this show? Where well, you're going to stay subscribed for eight weeks. Instead of just binging it all at once because people subscribe and people unsubscribe. Although like the number one streaming service in the world, um, binges shows and they're number one. And I I wonder if they're number one for a reason. Hmm. Could it be because they binge shows? Look at the, 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 the biggest shows on streaming Wednesday or stranger things. 
No, those aren't week two. How did they become the biggest shows in the world? <laughs> they don't stream those week to week. How did, to be fair, how did I it did. happen? Hmm, interesting. Was, um, I'm not misremembering right, but Squid Game was full, fully there right away, right? I'm pretty sure I binged Squid Game. Yeah, Squid Game was, was there right away. All, yeah, all, all those I, episodes. Yeah, I did, I did binge watch Squid Game. That was pretty damn amazing. But yes, uh, Fallout TV show has done really, really well. And, you know, people are really, really excited about it. And, you know, it's kind of doing what I'm sure Halo fans are wishing that the <laughs> Halo TV series had done. I mean, that's that's kind of like where the, like, for gaming, for Xbox fans and stuff like that, that's kind of like the aftermath of the discussion is like, how did, how did we go from like Fallout doing so well? And to be honest, I think Fallout is potentially more difficult to pull off than Halo. I mean, Halo is kind of like... I think Fallout's more difficult to even pull off than Last of Us. Yeah, I mean, because Fallout's like, you've got to... You've got to weave the humor in there. Mm -hmm. You've got to sort of. You've also got to be really violent. It's a weird combination to have like hyper violence, but also be ca almost cartoony and humorous, right? Whereas like these these other shows, like The Last of Us and Halo, they're they're sort of very serious, and you can play them really straight. All the source material is kind of there, you know, um, in a linear fashion for you to access. Whereas, like, the Fallout experiences, like, side quests and going all over the place, it's, like, so many different plot threads and all this kind of stuff. You would have thought pulling off a Fallout show would be ten times harder than pulling off a Halo show. But here we are. Here we are, Ren. <laughs> that's the Halo show that's not, hit, you know, landing it. And I think, I think part of that has to be because they've strayed so far away from the source material, you know. Um... Mm. I would, I would think, you know, it's Halo's popular for a reason, and <laughs> they kind of threw all that away, you know, well, to make to try and make their own pe thing. I don't know. Talk, it's weird because it's it's not weird, but you know, people talk about the decision Amazon chose to drop all the episodes of Fallout at once, and they're like, why did they do this? But they've done this in the past, which shows that essentially have a fan base. Um, maybe there's some rhyme or reason to it. Like, for instance, uh, Reacher. First season, they dropped all the episodes at once, and it became, uh, like, one of Prime's most watched shows. And then when season two came mm. out, they did it week to week. The Boys, season one, was also, um, when that first came out, that was also all the episodes at once. And then every season after that was week to week. Invincible. You know the the the, the cartoon uh, that you know the superhero cartoon that is amazing. Uh, I, I want to say that was no, I don't think they did they drop no that was always uh, week to week I believe. But there are series that they start off dropping all the episodes and then eventually for the next season they'll go to like every you know like once a week. Like they, mm. they usually do for these shows. So maybe there's something in it. Maybe they wanted like the whole video game community tweeting about it. Uh, because maybe Fallout doesn't have that uh, sort of uh, level of engagement with casual audiences yet. So they would want a lot of positive. Uh, a lot of positive. A lot of positive talk on social media to kind of seep in and be like, oh, maybe I should check the show out. And it becomes a success, and we already know it's been renewed for season two. So, I think season two is going to be the one that is week to week. Is this probably? I don't know. Maybe they weren't too sure how, how the how the broad reach outside of the video game community would be. So they they wanted to use like if everybody's like talking very highly about Fallout for a week, that might bleed through, um, and then get other people to watch it and then but but for next season i think they'll definitely do week to week but we'll talk about that a little bit later on i want to thank everybody for being here on this uh beautiful friday it's actually kind of getting nice here in chicago the weather's been all over the place and um if you could do us a big favor make sure you hit the like button and please subscribe if you 
haven't already, uh, got a lot of stuff to talk about here. So let's get through the uh, housekeeping so we can get into the uh, the good stuff, Jez. We have uh, got Manscaped. Right? We got some Manscaped. Got, got some Manscaped to talk about? Okay. We are back with Manscaped this week. This episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code XB2 for 20% off and free shipping. After using Manscaped, I can finally say I've caught the spring fever. Introducing the season's champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It also features dual LED spotlights to help guide your skin-safe blades even during the apex of a solar eclipse. Navigate with confidence in your delicate areas. Get 20% off on free shipping with code XB2 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code XB2 at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's Manscaped. Manscaped, thanks so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. You guys also checking out Manscaped really supports the show. And... Um, <clears throat> They've got all kinds of stuff. They've not just got, you know, trimmers for going down below. They've got an amazing range of boxes, all kinds of formulas, shampoo. Uh, I, re I actually really love their hair products, like their regular hair products. You know, I got, I got, I got a, lot, a lot of hair, long hair, unlike Rand, you know, Rand's going a little bald on the top, I think. Mm. But I'm just, you know, I'm, Aren't I'm seven still... out of ten men go, go bald, like get bald but... spots. Is that is that, is that true? Is something like the, uh, the the percentages of male oh, pattern that... baldness or whatever it is? I don't I don't like I don't like that figure. That sounds like a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh man! But but at least at least for now, I've I've still got hair to w upon which to use shampoo. So, you know, but uh, yeah, Manscaped. Thanks so much to them to for supporting the show, and thanks to you guys for checking them out. Yes. Also, we have the wonderful people at uh, patreon.com slash XP2. Support us with what we do. Uh, we did have an Xbox 2 Plus 1 this past week on Tuesday. We were joined by the one and only John, a.k.a. Sika Mechanico of Xbox Era, to talk everything Xbox and you know, a lot of media-related stuff, considering you know he runs as co-founder of Xbox Era and stuff. It was a... Uh, it was a really good discussion, so you guys can, uh, if yeah, you haven't was. listened to that yet, it's available right now, uh, Patreon exclusive, until uh, sometime next week. Uh, we won't have, I don't think we'll have an Xbox 2 plus, uh, Ultimate this upcoming week, because Jez is going to visit a studio, I think, right? That's what you said you're going, you're, you're busy, or whatever? Yeah, that's right, I'll, um, I'll be visiting a studio, and I'll be... I mean, I will be back on Tuesday afternoon, but I'll be probably very tired. Yeah, Got maybe maybe trouble. we can do something on Wednesday. But either way, uh, we appreciate everyone's there. Uh, the thread is up for questions. If you're listening and you haven't dropped a question, make sure you go do that. But we do have some shout-outs here. We've got Just James 93 Jay Peltier, Christian The Password, uh, Book and Beard, Holy Dark Deaths, Steve Stompy, James Wiseau, Trickster for Trey, The Grand Sabip, Battered Haddock, Omri Dude 52C, Ryan Kipple, Foreign Object, Mythic Marty, Ronick Donkey 99, Randall Thor 19, Silas, Eric Gregory, Elijah Vasquez, James Moore, Fantasticals, Halo is the Goat, Katerox, Bright Tundra 1, A Nice Cup of Liber Tea, Justin Duell, Frank Mariano, PB Broking, Asa T, and Madison, Governor Grimm, DZ Huffin, Achievement, The Scarecrow 121, Darren Tropy, Prof JJJ, Ghostface Killer, Wolf and Wolfgang, KPZ. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show and what we do here. So, yeah, Jez. Um, 
Jeez, what do you want to talk about first? I guess I'll just mention... We've got a bunch of super chats to get through. We do. I, I wanted to um, talk about my week, right? So we ended up... Did the show on Friday, and then the weekend it was all WrestleMania. Now, I used to... I don't know how often I told these stories, but I used to be really, really, really big into wrestling back in like the high school days. Back when DX and, you know... NWO and The Rock and Stone Cold were around, like, you know, during the, during the good old years of the Attitude Era of 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, whatever, that, that sort of time frame. Uh, and The Rock was always my guy. And, you know, and I've always been kind of keeping tabs of what's been going on, but I, I haven't actually watched a Raw uh, in forever. But with The Rock coming back, it got me. It got me, Jez. Now, I, the same way. I, 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 I didn't watch any, like, Raws, because, I don't know, three-hour shows, it's just kind of like, eh, but I'll watch some of the clips they'll post on social media, but I had to watch WrestleMania, and normally, every year, I will watch a WrestleMania if it has something, like, I usually would watch, like, a Royal Rumble and a WrestleMania, uh, so this week, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I watched both, both nights, and night two... The final match, you know, between Cody Rhodes and Roman Reign, no spoilers, was perhaps the best main event I've ever seen in a WrestleMania. Damn, that's hard. Like the 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 kid in me was going crazy, so I I really enjoyed that. I don't think I'll be watching week to week because I just I just I don't know. I I might like just kind of keep up on it just by watching clips on Twitter or whatever. But. Yeah, The Rock brought me back just for the weekend. I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm the same way. I was I was huge into it in high school. Really big into it. I was so into it. Uh, me and my friends were so into it that one of my my best friend from school actually pursued wrestling as a career and mm. actually did try out for the WWE. Um, uh, William Regal told him, uh, "Drop some bod, <laughs> drop some fat," <laughs> and um and come back next year, but. It's very, it's very tough when you've got kids and, and all that kind of stuff to, to grind, I think. But, um, but yeah, he was a awesome, awesome times, you know, with watching it with friends every Friday. Oh, yeah. We'd get around my house and we'd all watch it together. It was, it was a great time. And um, Did we... I haven't watched it since, I haven't watched it since then, Did since we... I was like We 19. used to go to my buddy's house back in 98, 99. And we would have two TVs, one TV on with with WCW Nitro, right? WCW, <laughs> and then the other TV would have Raw. So we we you know most people would like watch Raw or they switch back and forth. We would have both TVs side by side because uh, you know we were all into it, and it was just a wonderful time. We go every Monday, go to my buddy's house, and just. All of us would just chill and watch that stuff. I, I think their his parents probably hated the fact that Monday nights was like, nope, your whole living room where your big TV is 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 basically ours because it would just be you know me and like four other people just sitting there going going absolutely crazy. Um, but yeah, that, those were great times. So it it was cool to watch it again and see The Rock it brought me back. But yeah, also, so there was a solar eclipse. What was it on Monday? Oh yeah, solar eclipse. Yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, were, you, you, were you able you check to check it see? out? I mean, yeah. I, no, 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 no. It was. It wasn't in Europe. It wasn't, it wasn't visible in Europe. In Europe. No, no. Really. I'm sure you saw some of the photos. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I saw the memes. Yes, the Americans you see, freaking out. Did you see I saw Google? People, like people were like, "My eyes." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. I also saw people saying it was the end of the world. Yeah. And all this kind of weird stuff. You know, it's hilarious. But uh, the mass hysteria, you know. But uh, I saw, I did, saw you, some, did you get to check it out? I saw, I, I saw a report. It was on like Fox or whatever. And it was basically like, be careful that some of the, what was it? Some of the illegals and some of the smugglers are going to use that four seconds of darkness to cross the border or whatever. And I'm sitting oh there my like, God. have they heard what? of like, you know, nighttime that happens every <laughs> single night. <laughs> like, you know, but you gotta be watch out for the four minutes of darkness. That'll happen because of the eclipse. 
you know that is wild man but no yeah i was able to see some of it like you definitely you could you could you could see it uh it's it's always super cool there's all like always stories about like oh man when the solar eclipse happens or you know some some ghosts you know cthulhu and monster or whatever will come out or uh, the rapture would begin or whatever. And it's a really cool image. And it's it's really interesting when it's like, oh man, it's getting dark. It's the middle of the day, right? Because anyways, yeah. that, that, was, that, was, that was super cool. And um, I don't think there's been a solar, I don't think I've caught a solar eclipse, a full solar eclipse since I was like maybe 10 years old. I believe here. they said the next one is in 2045. But yeah. only going to be a visible in... Like a few areas, I think. Oh wow! Well. They don't. They don't. I mean, they can act. They can accurately predict when these things happen. You know. Yeah. But. This has been. This has been predicted for hundreds of years. Um, yeah. Because you know, the, it turns out that orbits are pretty easy to predict. But um, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's it's always cool and stuff like that. Can you imagine like being in medieval times and mm. seeing one of these things happen? You'd probably you'd freak be, out. You'd be freak. You'd be freaking out. Yeah. yeah. You'd definitely be like. The curse is upon us, or something. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, we're all doomed, and then four minutes later, oh, it's not that bad. Well, you probably, <laughs> you would still think it was a sign of some kind, even if you go yeah, back further. Yeah. An omen. Yeah, a, a, a very omen. dark omen, right? But uh, yeah. does anybody else in chat, did any of you guys check out the solar eclipse? Were you in the path? Because uh, I know I had a path of, like, totality, as they call it, um, where it's, like, complete, yeah. but... You were able to see it in some spots. Um, but yeah, you know, as far as gaming this week, I didn't really, I didn't play anything because my most anticipated book came out of the whole year. Oh, no. My most anticipated Here book. Here we of go. The, well, the th- here's the thing. Look, <laughs> I, I know I say like Hellblade 2 is my most anticipated game, and it is, and it has been for years. But. My one of my favorite ongoing series, the dude just released the penultimate volume, Ooh. and I was like, I gotta stop what I'm doing, and it's 700 pages long, and it was oh. like I, you know, I I kind of was like I, I have to finish this. I started reading it. I'm like I couldn't put it down, so I didn't really get any you know gaming in because I had to finish this book. It's called Disquiet Gods by Christopher Rocchio. It's the sixth book in the Sun Eater series. Science fiction. I am more like science fantasy, really. It's more of like a, a amalgamation of science fiction and fantasy. But for the penultimate book, bro, whew, 700 pages of pure awesome sauce. Mm. And now it's finished. And I have to wait however long it's going to take him to make the write the final book, but it doesn't matter because it's like if he does, no, he will. I, you know, I mean, I mean, aren't, aren't people still waiting for the final Game of Thrones? Uh, the final two Game of Thrones books, yes. George Martin <laughs> hasn't released anything in God. What is the last time? The uh, last book he released was like 2011. Uh, Dance with Dragons. Really? Yeah. He's uh, it's been a long time since he's released anything. That's crazy. I mean, man, if I was him, that would drive me crazy that I hadn't finished right. Oh, he it. doesn't care. Dude's rich. The show was a big success. He's doing a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't really think he cares to finish uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, come on. I, I don't know. That would drive me crazy, man. I yeah, mean, but he's... I know, he's... I know like, writing a book's hard, probably hard work, but... I just just knowing that I hadn't finished it when I was like at the final final stretch that would drive me up the wall man. Yeah, I mean it drives a lot. I mean it dr- drives a lot of his fans, the ones that have been I mean I started reading The Song of Ice and Fire back in 98, uh right when Storm of Swords came out. So yeah, I've been I waiting didn't for this. It was that old. Oh yeah, it's 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 up there. Like I've been waiting forever for George Martin to finish his series and he probably never will. We might get like Winds of Winter, which is the next book. Maybe he actually releases that, but there's no way he finishes and releases the final book, A Dream of Spring. Absolutely no way. 
Dude's too old. He probably doesn't care that much. Uh, he's probably he sound bitter. He sounded a little bitter. Well, I mean, him. you know, like I'm, it's not. I would re- <laughs> sound a little bitter. I would. Well, because it's a series that I love. It's it's one of the best written, you know, books. He hit him as an author is like absolutely incredible. And yeah, the TV shows kind of soured everything because I just sort of wonder how much of the TV show's ending was what he was going to do. And he saw the reaction to that and is like, Oh shit, <laughs> maybe, mm, you know, yeah, maybe. but still, I, I'm yeah, not, I'm yeah. not sure he's ever gonna, he's ever gonna finish it, which is a shame. Because at, yeah. at one point, Game of Thrones on HBO was a cultural phenomenon. It was. It was. And I yes, watched season one, but it was pretty cool. And maybe part of that was because it was week to week and not binged, but I don't know. <laughs> that's how TV model. That's how the TV model was back then on HBO on oh, TV. No. There was no streaming yet. Or maybe there was streaming. I just thought it was too long. I was like, man, this is long. Too long for me. Yeah, but anyways, I finished this Quiet Gods, and it was everything I needed it to be. Uh, epic moments, emotional beats, seven hundred pages of just gloriousness. And now I'm a broken shell of a man because I have to wait probably a year or more for the final book, and I don't want it to end. I don't want it to end. Well, hey, you can play some games. Well, yeah, now I can. You know, and there's the thing. Guess what? I did. I downloaded Fallout 4. Downloaded Fallout 4? Yeah. You can't play, you can't, you can't play that. It's not... You haven't, the next-gen update is not here yet. I mean, I downloaded it because I watched the TV show, and it got me in the mood to play Fallout 4. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to get to some of these super chats that people are sending in. We got Lee Bailey with the 499. The show made me want to play Fallout 5. There isn't one. I did New Vegas. Could have been the plan to have people scratch that itch into or retry 76. So yeah, like the whole, there's just all this Fallout hype going on. And I, what is it? There's, they announced the next-gen update for Fallout 4, which is coming April 25th, uh, 60 frames. And I think like content creation or Creators Club stuff is going to be added to the game. or Yeah, that's right. Something like that. Uh- yeah, I think uh, so. Go ahead. <coughs> oh, no, I just coughing. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, they're they're adding a bunch of I mean, it's resolution boost, frame rate boost, and you know some touch ups here and there. Uh, another tranche of bug fixes. <laughs> Still bug fixes, <laughs> of course. After all these years, and um, and then a the, uh, bunch of new creators club content, um, which is like um. You know, uh, um, approved mods that approved mods. that people have made. Approved mods, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's cool for me because I haven't done any of the DLC. So I did play the original. I actually reviewed it from Windows Central, and I was a little bit salty about it at the time because I felt like, you know, I didn't like the voice protagonist, and I felt like they'd scaled back on the how much your decisions mattered. So I was actually kind of salty about Fallout 4, even though like I really loved the gameplay. The gunplay was much improved. The crafting systems were great. I love building settlements. I spent a lot of time building settlements. I know you won't do that. No. But and also the the violence was just absolutely spectacular. Like when oh, you smash someone's face in, in slow motion. The violence in the show, Jess. Oh man. Yeah, I've I've heard good things, man. But the violence in the game, you know, like slow motion eyeballs popping out. You know, it's incredible there's just no i really felt like starfield was missing that you know like when, when you've got like i was I, I remember thinking man imagine the this gore fallout's gore in this zero gravity it would have been so cool alas they didn't want to put the gore in starfield for some reason it, which i really think detracted from the gunplay but anyway that's just that's another discussion we don't need um, you on a rant about that again you really were no, I'm I'm still salty about that. But anyway, uh, Fallout 4, I haven't done the DLC, so I'm waiting for the next-gen update, and then I'm going to jump back in and do some of the DLC. Um, I think a lot of people are getting into it. I've also, I also downloaded um, Fallout 76 as well, 
Um, and I am going to set up uh, a dedicated private server for the Xbox Two Discord community to to get into Fallout seventy six. I'm going to start over from scratch, mm. and we can all venture into the the wasteland together. Because honestly, Fallout seventy six is a solid single player Fallout game. You know, you don't have to engage with any of the multiplayer stuff if you don't want to. It's still got single player story. And all that kind of stuff and now it's got tons of dlc as well to to go through it's an authentic fallout story even when it launched like it was an authentic fallout story it didn't have npcs but it's still the way they delivered the story in the original a lot of environmental storytelling was very very good i really enjoyed it even back then so um yeah everyone's hyped on fallout but you know the thing we're missing with fallout right now rand there's a fallout 5 announcement Mm, you think they should have announced it I think they should have at least announced it. I mean, hell, they announced Elder Scrolls 6, which we're not getting for a million years, and I'm kind of like, they've kind of announced Fallout 5 because Todd Howard teased in interviews Yeah, they talked about it, how they had a one-sheet for it or whatever. Yeah, and and they said, like, during the TV show, don't, don't do this because we're going to be doing this in Fallout 5, you know, so there, there wouldn't be overlap because... Um, Fallout, the TV show, is supposedly canon in the timeline. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, so, they, they are... And I think this is where the Halo TV show goes wrong, by the way. Um, like, the Halo TV show is like its own thing, but the Fallout TV show... And there are, there are some little differences here and there. I think that they, they 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 change the names of certain things for clarity, I think, and stuff like that. But like the what that what they say is um, with regards to the timeline and stuff, the sort of the big ticket events, they are canon, you know, and that everything else is up to interpretation. So like they even said that Fallout Tactics is canon recently, um, which I don't think they've said before. But again, they reiterated it's for. Um, it's for the big main events of those games rather than like, you know, the gameplay elements or the, 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 the way things are named and stuff like that. So I think that's really, really exciting. So yeah, I, I'm loving the Fallout hype. I'm a big Fallout fan. I actually ordered the, um, the new Pip-Boy replica off the mm. Bethesda gear store okay. um, against my better judgment because I've already got two other Pip-Boys. <laughs> I've got no room for another one, but I ordered it anyway. Um, but yeah, for everyone's in Fallout mode now. Yeah, I love it. Well, there, you know, so they announced the the next gen update coming the twenty fifth. I think there's stuff going on in Fallout seventy six. Uh, I think there's even like some free Fallout games on what Prime maybe or. Uh... Yeah, Prime. I mean, to be honest, Prime, um, Prime Gaming, which is Amazon Prime's um subscription service, they've had Fallout one and two of for free yeah. for a long time with prime gaming but people are just noticing now so yeah prime gaming has all that stuff there's also like there's also um uh a lot of great deals you can get fallout ultimate bundle for like five dollars or something Ooh. It's, it's crazy man like uh, it's i wonder i sort of fallout wonder real, bro. if they would just rather have people go into fallout 76 because if like you're somebody who watches the show and you're like and we we've, we've seen it. If a show's really good, people will play the game, right? We've we've seen it with any with all these adaptations. So I sort of wonder if they're like, okay, let me check out this Fallout game. And the one that's currently kind of being talked about the most and the most recent is Fallout seventy six, which also is live service game that has monetization. You know, like you can spend more money. I wonder if that's where they would rather funnel people into. Rather than say Fallout Four, or you know something else, I think they're. I don't think they're being overly strategic about it. I think they're honestly just happy for any for people to play Fallout wherever they go. I mean, I've been tempted recently to give Fallout One and Two a try because I actually never really played them. I played I played a bit of Fallout One, but I never really gave it a proper you know proper look so i'm even considering doing that while i wait for the fallout next gen upgrade which is coming on april 25th that you said yes, right yeah yeah for... i mean yeah so it's all it's all about that fallout hype right you got the tv show people are tweeting about it people are talking about it 
Um, they did the right way of releasing it all at once. So everybody can finish the show <laughs> at their leisure and talk about how amazing it is instead of dragging it on week to week to week to week so we can imp- we can see people's tweets that are like, I watched episode three and it was really good. <laughs> and that's the extent of the discussion. <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, man. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Anyways. Uh, anyways. Anyways. Group chats. Anyways. Uh, face. Twenty three PK. Nineteen ninety nine. We have. Uh, he says, "What's going on with Mike Ibarra lately? He's been ta- talking a lot on Twitter, saying things like PlayStation's got bangers, and he would pay more for games." Yeah. The whole. I don't know if you saw his tweet about like if he wishes there yeah. was a way to like tip. Like, oh, you bought a game, but then you loved it so much, you want to actually give them more money. Which I find an interesting discussion, but I think that only really works if it's like an indie game. Because I'm certainly not going to tip mm, yeah. a billion a billion dollar corporation. and Because you know that the money ain't going to be going to the developers. Like, oh, I really enjoyed Prince of Persia, which I did. But let's just say I could tip them. What money is this going to go to Ubisoft? It's going to go to Yiz Gimbo. Well, you know? So it's kind of like... I don't want to tip. I want to. I want to. If I were to do that, I would want to make sure and know that the money that I'm giving is going straight to the developer. Which is why I say like it doesn't really work for a developer under a you know like a a huge publisher. But maybe it would work for like Team Cherry, who makes Hollow Knight Silk Song. Like it's just four guys, and they're not under a publisher. And they don't have any agreement. So like, oh, you tip them and it goes right to them. I think that could work, but I think anything under like a large publisher umbrella is just kind of like, no, because you know the money's not going to go to them. I'm kind of in two minds about it because I've actually thought about this myself and I thought about it because of Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Like okay. I felt I, I loved Monster Hunter World Iceborne so much. I put a thousand hours into that game. I bought every scrap of DLC that I could find. And I was I I was buying the DLC not because I wanted to use it, and th- I'm talking like hairstyles and you know random bits of clothing and stuff like that. Not not because I wanted it, but because I was like I want more Iceborne. You know, I want more monsters, I want more stuff, and this is the only way I'm going to get it if I <laughs> personally fund the game. Um, so I've often thought like, you know, maybe tipping, you know, and I know this is a controversial opinion, so you know maybe tipping would be a good thing because not just because of like um you know the devs getting more money or well the publishers getting more money but you got to remember that devs also get a profit well most publishers or a lot of publishers do this profit sharing pool thing right where if they hit certain profit levels they do get money you know and that's i know that's not every dev but there's also this kind of thing like um you wouldn't tip ea because you don't like them right mm. because they keep doing yeah. stupid stuff EA's, like on, closes... ea's on my shit list right now yeah ea's on your shit list but what if right tipping became a thing and then ea was like incentivized to get off your shit list because i would never tip ea i would never tip ubisoft because well i don't know maybe i would tip ubisoft, would you tip but microsoft I would never, I w- uh mm, well i did i'd, I'd want to know about how they were going to do this how they were going to do it right so if they were like the tips go direct if they were going to say if microsoft came out and said the tips go directly to the developers in a pool or something i would do it right i would do that for games i really really enjoyed um but if it was like if they weren't clear about where the tips were going i would only tip if it was like either an indie dev or um a studio like capcom that i really really liked you know um because capcom kind of like has shown itself they've increased how much they pay their devs and a bunch of stuff like that and they've kind of like uh, you know for me you know earned some of that stuff especially with like they they put so much content into monster Hunter world for free you know, and oh yeah, Iceborne was a paid expansion, but it was huge. It, it could have been its own game. It was so damn big. Um, but like, there, there are my. What's the opposite of a shit list? 
What, uh, what's the opposite of a shit what list? What is the opposite of a shit list? Chat, chat, what is the opposite of a shit list? I, I don't know. Um, uh, What would you call it? Stra- strawberry list? Good boy list? I don't know. <laughs> happy list? <laughs> Capcom's on my happy list, you know. Um, So, like, I would tip them, but... I don't know. I kind of feel like it, it might incentivize EA to be less shitty if if the, if this became like a lucrative thing. Uh, but also you... at the same time, I, I appreciate the idea that they're already nickel and diamond us. And, yeah, and, EA, and goes, then you're gonna... EA always goes through these cycles where they're like, oh, they're back and they got some cool stuff. And it's like, oh, we hate them again. Oh, we love them again. Oh, we hate them again. Because they go through these cycles where it was like, oh, let's bring back some fan favorites. Let's do some single player stuff. And then people are like, yeah. And then like the single player stuff doesn't do what it's supposed to do, at least according to them. They're like, no, we're not doing this anymore. And everyone's like, fuck you. You know? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 We'll talk about what happened with Dead Space, which is why EA's back on my shit list again, because ugh, it makes me so I yeah, Dude, I angry. knew this was going to happen. Yeah, I, I knew uh, this, this was going to happen before. too. This, you can't trust some of these corporations. But as for Mike Ybarra talking yeah. about playstation games and and calling them bangers i mean mike likes good, good games so playstation you know has very much critically has, has some really incredible games so mike's probably yeah. playing them now for the first time because for a long time mike was very much a destiny guy a world of warcraft guy you know when you're when you're playing all that sort of stuff you're not really having a lot of time to go play some of the other experiences like red dead redemption or last of us and things of that nature so yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, we have Elijah Vasquez, member for 19 months. Rand, did you forget about your camera? I have not. Don't make us wait till June. Lol. P.S. Hope you guys have a good show. We will have a great show. Uh, Jay Rembert says, Yabara is a PlayStation fanboy, full stop. I wouldn't <laughs> say that. Uh, Face, 23BKNY, says, X-Men 97 is fire, better than the original. I do keep on seeing people say that, which actually... Makes me want to yeah, check heard, it out. Uh, I've heard good things about that. I actually watched... I, I always talk about how I'm not a big superhero um, superhero fan in general, but I actually did watch that series as a kid, so that would be kind of nostalgic for I me. I did. I did too. Uh, yeah. We have NC with the two. If you need more Fallout, try Wasteland 3. I don't need Fallout that badly. <laughs> Wasteland 3 is definitely um, not my thing, but it is definitely just thing. so good. It's so good. Wasteland 3 is so damn good. Uh, Lewis Jones with the 199 says, What happened to Gears of War show or film? I think they're still doing it. It's a Gears of, it's a Gears of War film and an animated show uh, yeah. that Netflix announced. But I don't think we've seen any movement on casting or shooting. It's not like they've started shooting the the film so i don't know i mean we haven't gotten any updates on it like it's not like oh by the way this has been canceled so i i do wonder well also they announced that stuff and then the strikes happened so maybe that pushed some things around i could ask i could find out we'll see what happens with all that uh gold maybe maybe like after sorry maybe after the Halo TV show, then maybe they're um, rethinking their approach to this stuff, maybe. And maybe they're being cautious with how Gears is done. Because they're, lo- they're locked in with Halo now. They're, they're committed to Paramount, and they're committed to this helmless, yeah. helmetless Master Chief and the Master yes. Cheeks, and they're committed to it. But maybe they want to make sure they get Gears expanded stuff right the first time around. Um, yeah. There's a grounded TV show as well, right? There's going to be a grounded TV show. The problem with Netflix is their movies are usually pretty bad, and their shows are usually good. Mm. So it's kind of like... I like some of Netflix's movies. Yeah, Netflix's movies... Irishman was really good. Well, I mean, that's Martin Scorsese. That's different. Like, the old Hollywood, they didn't want to... A green light, a two hundred two hundred million dollar mob Martin Scorsese film, but Netflix was like, "We'll do it," and it was like, "Okay, Scorsese. so yeah, it's Martin Scorsese." So of is course, he? it's going to be good. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know, Martin Scorsese. I'm gonna say, 
I was Scorsese? Say Scorsese. Whatever. Scorsese? Scorsese? Scorsese. Scorsese. Whatever. It's, in my head, that's, that's how you say it. Whatever. I don't think it's wrong. <laughs> Scorsese? <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry uh, Gold sorry. Shell with the two. Sandland anime on Hulu is great. Game is coming this month. Yeah, people have been talking about that too, about how the uh, the anime is pretty good. But I'm not an Which anime, anime? Guy. Sandland. Which I think is the the Dragon Ball Z Dragon oh, yeah. Ball creators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Akira Toriyama. Like I apparently the, the anime is really good, but I've looked at some videos of the game and it it doesn't look so hot to me. But I don't know. Maybe it plays better than it looks. I don't know. We'll see. Uh JJ Saiyan one one seven says Conspiracy. Do you think the jerk that caused the blizzard Blizzard NetEase deal to fail was Yabara? If yes, it could explain why he left. Or maybe Kotick did it. So yeah, um, I guess I guess hard to say. one of the things that we probably should talk about is the I don't want to say like resurgence, but Blizzard and NetEase after their deal fell apart last year and basically all of their, of their games were removed from China, right? Because NetEase was the publisher of the Blizzard games in China, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong here, Jazz. No, you're correct. Like, NetEase, NetEase was the publisher, but also, because of the way China is, yes, the games have to be reworked. They have to be uh, censored, and they have to be... Everything has to be approved. And obviously, you you kind of want a local studio to be able to help you with that process because it is very strict and very stringent. World of Warcraft in China is very different to World of Warcraft in the West. Like, there's a lot of what are, what are a some lot of the changes? story. Um, no skeletons, uh, for example, right? No, like there's that? no skeletons. There's no no visible bones. All those. I don't think there's any undead in general. I think off the top of my head. But it's stuff like that, you know, cultural stuff, you know. And also, like, certain plot elements are, are tweaked, I think. Um, there's, a, there's a list somewhere of changes that they made to World of Warcraft, for example, for Chinese market. So it's stuff like that, right? Um, but it's kind of like... it's kind, It kind of sucks for... If you're just, like, a, a regular Chinese gamer... And you've, you know, you've got, you've had a World of Warcraft account and you've loved it and you've, you know, all your social life's through the game and you've got a character that you've loved for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, um, a bunch of like, you know, essentially male egos resulting you losing access to your game. It's like, it's, it sucks, man. And the, the people were like, you know, uh, they were pissed and they were, that like one of the reasons Overwatch is so downvoted on Steam apparently is at least partially because of people voicing their their anger over the way this whole NetEase thing went down, and also NetEase was super ang- super angry about it, and they did they even did like ceremonial destruction of Blizzard iconography at their studio and like all this kind of stuff. It sounds like something really bad went down, right? I have no idea whether it was Kotick, whether it was Yubara um what happened there but clearly with the changing of the guard the thawing of relations happened and not only and i thought this was interesting not only did um uh they talk about how they're bringing blizzard games back to china and all that kind of stuff they also talked about netties exploring working with xbox on bringing some of their you know, their Eastern games, which maybe they haven't been released in the West, um, bringing those to Xbox yeah, as well. There was that. So was, they um, want to bring that. Do you, and you know, do you know of any games from NetEase that were in, uh, that potentially could be a fit to bring over to Xbox and other platforms? Cause they did mention other platforms. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I, it's something I wanted to research where I've just been really busy this week. But uh, stay tuned for that. I'll have a, I'll have a better analysis coming down the pipeline. Let me see. I'll, I'll just go to Google and I'm gonna just Google NetEase games and see what. Well, they make stuff like um, Nakara Blade Point. Yeah, they make stuff uh, like Nakara Blade Point. 
Uh, there's a game here called Once Human. So multiplayer open world survival game set in a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, oh. Identity. Join the thrilling party. Welcome to Identity 5, the first asymmetrical horror mobile game. Uh, it wouldn't be that. Uh, Life I mean, After is an open world doomsday survival game. Uh, they're, they're so they're like Tencent. They're a service game giant, you know. Right. Well, they're they're also making giant. the Marvel Marvel Rivals game that we talked about a couple weeks ago, but we're pretty sure that's already coming to consoles, even though it was only announced for PC. So yeah, I wonder what what uh, games they would want to consider bringing over that aren't already over here because there's like a whole there's like a whole list like i'm looking like knives out uh blood strike blood strike is a fast-paced fps battle royale mobile game well it's a mobile game so maybe not uh dead well you know mobile lord of the rings microsoft is don't forget microsoft is working on a mobile game store for when true that is true really yeah when apple gets cracked open so it could be that like NetEase supports the Xbox Game Store and mobile when it does eventually come. Yeah. So that deals back, and you know when Jay says, "Who do you think the jerk was?" That the the context for that was, I believe, the NetEase president said that the reason the deal. F- fell apart was because of a single jerk at blizzard right wasn't that the whole yeah, context yeah, around yeah. it yeah he said it's he said something and i'm paraphrasing he said something along the lines of it's crazy how one jerk can dis- destroy an entire relationship or something like now, that." Now a lot of people thought that was kotick because kotick head of activision and you know not really liked by people in the media or gamers really so they thought oh that's the jerk and, and maybe it was so I will probably never find out, but it's uh, this deal is signed between Microsoft Gaming and NetEase. So yeah, the Blizzard games will come back to China. Nice, get a revenue boost and a monthly active users boost and stuff. So it's uh, yeah. it's cool to see because yeah, it would suck if you're a fan over there and you've been playing World of Warcraft forever and then it's like you can't access it anymore. So it's cool. It's cool that it's uh, that it's coming back. Yeah, but. On the flip side of stuff, there is some bad news. Another studio got shut down, and potentially an Ooh. Xbox exclusive was canceled along with it. Ah. So, <laughs> Jeff Strain. Vonnegut. Yeah, Jeff Strain, who is the who used to run Undead Labs, left Undead Labs, and went and formed what was it Possibility Space? I believe yeah. it was called, but then there's other studios attached to it because apparently people are saying this is like the second studio is closed in like two weeks or something. Yeah. And uh, I I think emails have come out where where he had wrote to the team about why they're being laid off, and essentially he said somebody from Kotaku was writing a story uh, about the company and that they had all this inside information that is usually gotten through hacking. But the guy said, no, my information comes from current employees, like their prof, their P and L statements and all this sort of stuff that is usually highly confidential. And Jeff Ooh. said that he had to like hop onto a, a flight to visit their partner who's publishing the game and funding the game. And, they both came to the mutual decision to cancel the game, which was called Vonnegut, which was also Vonnegut, yeah. Vonnegut which was a game that a, uh, a project from Xbox or an Xbox project that Jeff Grubb originally talked about. And then I think you had corroborated. Um, I don't know how long ago, maybe a year ago or two years ago it was. Yeah. It was, I think it was two or three years ago. It was one of the, one of the code names from that, a big tranche of yeah. code names I had. And um, there was always the, the rumor that it was a shadow run game of some kind. Yeah. Jeff like, Grubb added that bit, I think. Yeah. Cause I didn't know what it was. I just had the code name and that, that's all I had. But that was when Jeff was still on undead labs though. Mm. So that's weird thinking about it. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, 
because of that, because of the leaking of the highly confidential info, I guess the publishing partner didn't want to move forward or didn't want to put more money into the project. So they mutually decided to end the project. And because they ended the project, he had to shut down the studio and, and was basically, if you guys read the email, which you can find, uh, it is a, <laughs> comes across as very petty. One of the more petty emails from a CEO about why people are getting laid off. And mm. it's just another studio and more layoffs in the time of the video game industry where it's like everybody's getting laid off. But this one also was kind of just had the extra drama of a Xbox code name being, it's like, oh, well, Von, you know, the, the, our game Vonnegut. And it was like, oh, Vonnegut, wait a minute, that's an Xbox, or maybe it was, or maybe it wasn't, but... Yeah, I mean, that is that is very <laughs> I don't even know what to say cuz I read the emails and I, it and and like like I said, it he comes Jeff does not come off well in those emails. No, it's very very strange. Yeah. I mean, I can I can appreciate that he's angry about it, but it's like you don't like take out and you you the whole dev team like maybe maybe like one person leaked it or something and you have to sort of blame everyone for that if it, it felt like the whole email was designed to try and make the, the the source feel guilty or whatever but i don't know i kind yeah. of feel like it was you don't you don't cancel a game because of leaks you cancel a game for other reasons yeah maybe it was a project that wasn't going along well anyways if if whoever the publishing partner was whether it was microsoft or somebody else was like i don't know if we're gonna want to pump the money into this anymore let's just end it people are becoming increasingly risk averse mm -hmm. in the, in gaming you know we've, we've heard about funding drying drying up but for things like uh you know the epic game store deals and we've heard about um venture capital drying up for funding new studios and all that kind of stuff hey the gold rush was over for xbox game pass wasn't that a whole thing that was kind of rescinded a little bit or yeah, taken I mean, out of context i rescinded it because i heard i heard that microsoft will spend more on game pass deals in this fiscal than they ever have which kind of goes against the narrative being put out there that they're pulling back from Game Pass. I remember there was a narrative that they're pulling back from cloud as well. Mm. And it's like they literally just well, announced new cloud features. That was this because week. they said that during like the depositions with the FTC that like their investment in cloud was almost close to zero during like the FTC trial and all that sort of stuff. Which is which is weird to me because clearly it's not. Well, I mean, now that the zero. FTC trial is over, now it's back back to full steam ahead <laughs> with the cloud stuff, I guess. Yeah, I guess, but, hey, you know. It's full steam ahead, let's go. I don't know. Bloody FTC. What are they yeah, like? Bloody here? FTC. Um, they, uh, they announced they're putting net neutrality back into play, so the FTC. Did they? Yeah, apparently. Hmm. Interesting. Also, um, let's see. I wanted to talk about the Fallout TV show a little bit, Jez. Oh, go on then. Because no spoilers though, because no, 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 I haven't no, no. watched. I'm it. not going to spoil. It. I'm not. Gonna... A lot of people in chat. I'm not going to spoil it. it. I'm just going to give general basic thoughts. Now, you, you, you know, I've always said that I'm more of an Elder Scrolls guy than a Fallout guy, right? Yeah. I played Fallout Three, and that's really it. I mean, I enjoyed my time with Fallout Three, but I haven't played Fallout Four, and um, but watching the trailers for this, it, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, they're making a Fallout TV show. And it's like, eh, uh, uh, you know, that'll yeah. be fun for people who enjoy Fallout. But then I watched the trailer and I was like, man, that actually looks good. Mm. And so uh, the reviews came out and I think it's like a 92 on Rotten Tomatoes. It seems to be well liked. Even, you know, sometimes you'll have the the divide of like the critics like it, but the fans hate it or the critics hate it and the fans love it. Right. Sometimes those can happen. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like if you really piss off the fans, if you mess around with lore or you just, it seems like you don't respect the legacy of the games. Uh, the fans will go up an uproar, and maybe they'll they'll downvote stuff, or they'll they'll do all that sort of things. It doesn't really seem like that's happening with this one. A lot of people talk about it maybe potentially being 
the best video game adaptation of all time. Uh, in that, yeah. Causing some drama because, uh, you know, Last of Us, which just came out from HBO, is probably considered the best video game adaptation ever. It won a bunch of Emmys. So, you know, people saying Fallout. So it's become like an Xbox versus PlayStation thing, I guess. Because, you know, Microsoft so owns this, Fallout. Is this where the console war is going now? Like, every, every, everything is going to be multi-platform, and now the console war is going to move to which has the better TV shows. Yeah, I mean, oh, I don't man. know. The, the platform wars, I guess. Yeah. But, so, I was Ecosystem like, all right. Ecosystem wars. So I finished my book yesterday, and I felt hollow. Because I was like, I gotta wait another year or whatever as long as for him to finish it. And it was such an incredible journey, 700 pages. I was like, I don't really want to start a game tonight. Let me start Fallout TV show. And once I hit that play button, four episodes went by. I watched four episodes in a row. Because binging is a superior method. And I am, I wouldn't say I'm shocked because this is from Jonathan Nolan who, you know, did Westworld and stuff. Is he related to the other Nolan? Yes, he is Christopher Nolan's brother. Oh, snap. Yeah. And I got to say Fallout, the TV show is, I'm only four episodes in. There's eight episodes. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. I can see why people call it maybe the best video game ever. Because normally when, when video games get adapted, it's like you're always going to – there's going to be something that's wrong or it's just like, oh, someone can thinks they can do it better than the, the original. But there's a lot – that like everything works here, and it works beautifully. Like they've captured what makes Fallout fo- Fallout, like the over-the-top gore, uh, the comedy, the dark humor. uh like, do you even get a scent like the, the vault life, which is great? Like, and everybody nails their roles. Like the main actress, uh, she's good at what she, you know, she's she's very happy, peppy, wants to. So you're kind of exploring the world with her because she's a vault dweller, and I I think her character absolutely nails it. I've but, heard her described as Ned Flanders in the apocalypse. Yes, essentially. Because she thinks, because the the way like her vault has been raised is like everybody helps each other, and it's a you know like it's she kind of has that sort of uh, philosophy Jealous. as she goes out into the the wasteland, like introduces herself to other to raiders, and the raiders just look at her and move on, or tries to to bargain, but it definitely comes from just naive place about how she thinks the world should be and like oh you know the vaults are here to save to save america and everyone's just looking at her like it's the perfect like fish fish out of water story but the character grows and develops over the course of the episodes uh i won't say you know, like why or how but obviously it's a transition because you can't have the character remain the same which is why i was really happy with the idea of this naive bright-eyed girl going into the wasteland because you knew, because you know, by the end of it, her character is going to be completely changed. You couldn't really have started off with the show with the character who's already sort of uh, jaded or what have you, uh, because then where's the character going to go? So it's it's fun to see a character start off like innocent to a certain degree, and then like the road traveled in the wasteland. But um, Walton Goggins. Veteran of the, the Shield. Show, Anybody who's seen the Shield knows how amazing he is. He's also been in Justified. The what? Not the, the not not team? the Shield tag team. The TV show, <laughs> The Shield. Seth freaking Rollins. Not Seth freaking it? Rollins and and Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. Um, anybody who it's watched it Ambrose. back in the day on FX, one of the best TV shows ever. It gets overrated, and he was one of the best characters on that show. It's he's a character. Or he's an actor that everybody knows. But, like, when you see him, like, oh, yeah, it's that guy. He's really good. But you you don't know his name, you know? You just know it's like, oh, this guy is going to deliver a great performance. And he does. And he has the dual performance of... Because the show isn't just about the current... What's currently going on 
in the wasteland and the story they're trying to tell. They also have flashbacks to, you know, before the bombs dropped, right? So you kind of get a you kind of get a little bit of that before how the world was before, and that's kind of his character Walt Goggins kind of linchpin for that. Uh, but him as the ghoul, it's fantastic. He's got some really great lines, really great like uh, maneuvers and some some things he does that I don't want to spoil that are just great, right? Even the Blood Heart of the Steel stuff is 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 really good too. I would say probably the weakest link in the show is the uh, character who uh, the other like because they kind of have set up in like the three characters. You have the girl, you have Walton Goggins as the ghoul, and you have the the guy who wants to be in the Brotherhood of Steel. I think his story, at least for now in these first four episodes, is probably a little bit on the weaker side. It's kind of the one that. They 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 do try they do try to make it more funny, uh, especially as the episodes go. But I always find myself more invested when she's on screen, or when the ghoul's on screen, or when we even go back to what's happening in the vault, Vault Thirty Three, and the mystery going on there, uh, mm-hmm. because. It's it's really like everything looks great, like the set design, the acting, like the it's. I don't know where it's leading either, right? Because I don't know too much about the Fallout story, but it is definitely something where I'm like, let me watch another episode and another and an, like they freaking nailed it, bro. And I can actually see it being. Cons- There's part of me watching this. And I'm like, yeah, there are elements of this that are better than Last of Us for sure. And I thought Last of Us was probably, well, Last of Us and Arcane. I don't, I don't know, like Arcane, uh, you know, the the Netflix show from League of Legends. You could probably put there up. You could probably say that's even better than Last of Us. But also, it's like Last of Us is a retelling of the first video game, where this is like a brand new story within the Fallout universe that also takes place within all the continuity. Where like last, it's, Last of Us isn't telling a new story; it's just retelling the story that's already been told. And maybe that's—I don't know—maybe that's harder to do because it's like the story's already been told, and you need to find ways to make it more engaging. Where this is like a brand new story within the thing, and it's like so good, bro. I can't wait for you to watch this because it's fantastic, and you're the Fallout guy. Yeah. So. You know, I I was kind of hoping you would watch at least one episode before we did the show today. Yeah, yeah. But busy like, boy, man. I'm a busy boy. Time. I don't got time. I don't got time. I don't got time to finish yeah, I Persona. I don't got time to watch an episode of Fallout. <laughs> I don't got time. You know, I finished. I finished my second playthrough of Dragon's Dogma, though. Oh, did you? I did. Yeah, and now I'm done with that game. Uninstalled it. Oh, okay. I did every single quest in the game. Every single thing. I'm done. Uh, until they drop some DLC, but yeah, I will watch it, man. It sounds fantastic. I'm all back on the Fallout high train. Fallout. I'm a Fallout guy. You know, it's it's my. I prefer Fallout to Elder Scrolls overall. Um, but I am I am probably more of a casual fan. I I've been I've been sort of watching some of the conversations online about Fallout, and I think a lot of casual like Fallout fans who just you know maybe they played Fallout Three and. They like it and stuff, but they're not too deep on on the lore and stuff. Um, there have been some lore uh, controversies about the show. Apparently, um, I've seen some, you know, fans of the classic Fallout games, um, and even Fallout Three, question, you know, some of the stuff about the you know the timeline and stuff but they can't they they clarified some of that stuff on twitter as well but it's just funny seeing like the the fans go over every detail with a fine tooth comb just to look for inconsistencies in the law because you know there is a huge amount of law in this universe you know and i think it's i think it's cool that they even approached it with the mentality of we're going to try and be faithful to the law and this is also going to be potentially canon unlike halo which kind of 
you know, threw all that stuff out the window. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty excited to see how the show develops, and I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you can watch it at least one or a couple episodes by Friday for the show next yeah. week. I but will. I will. I, I'm, pro- I'm on most the, likely. I'll watch it on the plane. Going to finish the show tonight. I'm going to watch the next four episodes, and I'm just going to binge right through it. Because it's the superior way to watch a TV show, Paris. If you're still you know, here I, actually, and you're still listening. What? Yeah, I, I, I've I, just realized you're completely right about being able to binge watch a show. Of course it's better. Because one of the ways I find time to binge watch a show is when I'm traveling. And I wouldn't be able to binge watch a show if I could only access one episode. So mm. actually, I, I you. But hey, you right. watched the one episode. You can discuss it on Twitter by saying how much you like the episode, and that's it. No, you're you're right. You're you're completely right. Now now it affects me. Now it affects me. You're right. I Damn agree. right. I'll down. I'm gonna download all the episodes to my phone, and then watch them with my X real glasses on. Um, I guess on I guess you could say one of one of the one of the cons I have of it is that the CGI they use is bad. The, like the mm. CGI they use for the abominations, which you've seen some in the trailers, that big, huge, like pink thing. I, I don't know what it's called. It looks bad. The, the centaur. Uh, it, it, whatever. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Not the. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the thing that comes out of the water. I yeah. saw that in the trailer. Yeah. It, li- it looks bad. Like the CGI looks bad I for that. It looked pretty good. No, it looks bad. It definitely. When you're watching the scene with it and you're watch, watching interact, it just. It stands out so it, it 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 looks bad in comparison to everything else around it because like the set design, the apocalypse, like all that stuff's great because it looks like well, it looks like an apocalypse should look like after a whole bunch of bombs mm. go off. But that it really just is jarring how it's just out of place it is. And obviously, like nothing like that exists in reality anyway, so you already know it's fake. But it just comes across as like. Yeah, it's the CGI, and you can definitely tell. Same thing with like people in chat say it's uh, Gulpa and Axolotl. Okay, mutated Axolotl. But like that would be that would be one of the cons. Like when when those, I mean, you got to have it. Everyone as said it looks good, and that you're wrong. I don't know. I thought it looked. I thought it looked out of place. Out of place in the sense that you can definitely tell it's like as fake as fake can be. Well, uh, dude, it's a giant mutated axolotl. I know, axolotl. but I'm just I'm just saying it's just. Are you saying they should have genetically engineered a, a no, real life? No, I, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have included it, but when everything else seems to be shot on location in a way where it doesn't really seem like they used a lot of green screen like, or blue screen backdrops. When, something, like it's, when something's mostly practical effects and then you have to go to yeah, CGI. It, it I mean, it was a little jarring. Yeah, I can't imagine like how complicated it would have been to have turn something like that into a practical effect um that actually look good as well it's hard to pull that off when you're doing sci-fi like yeah i mean that that's that's really it like that's really my only and that's not even really anything that would affect the score it's like yeah the cgi for these monsters that don't exist looks bad in comparison to the practical set design they use it's like everything else is like top notch like i i love everything else about the show it's so much more than I thought it would ever be. And I'm like, all right, like this is, this is really good. Like video game adaptations have been really strong. I know a lot of people love the super Mario movie. I hated it, but a lot of people are like, Oh, super Mario movies. Great. Last of us. Great. You know, fallout. Great. Uh, Halo, which was mostly derided for season one. Everybody says season two is a, a, a much an improved but still, it's kind of like doing its own thing. It's kind of like not part of the games. And you know, like you look at Fallout and how well it's doing, and it's being praised for being very much uh, within within the continuity and lore of it. So, I think you kind of you're missing a trick when you don't try and incorporate it into the lore because fans will watch it because they they want to know what the new lore is. But like, I don't have to give a shit about the TV show. Because it's got nothing to do with I just anything. Wonder, I just game. wonder if, like... Yeah, I don't know. Like, with, with, with Halo, could they have just started with Halo 
Combat Evolved and started a show and just did the first game as the first season of a show. I'm not necessarily sure that would work. I think they they needed to do something adjacent to the games. Like, I don't know, something that's set in the universe, the adventure of someone... I mean, it's it's tough because you kind of want Master Chief in there. But at the same time, I think Fallout's, Fallout TV show is working really well with new characters. But then again, the the main character in Fallout is literally you, not Master Chief or something. I don't know, man. I don't know what would have been best for a Halo TV show at the end of the day. Um, uh, speaking of which, I have just confirmed that the Gears project is still on the cards. It's not cancelled. Okay. That's good. Just in just in, just, just in case there was any doubt. We just haven't heard anything about it, maybe because of the strikes yeah. and everything, but gear stuff is still a go. And the Fallout show is so good, Jez, that I re-downloaded Fallout 4. And yeah, I'm interested in playing it. Because watching it. the game it. makes me want to play... Or watching the TV show makes me want to play, play the game because I've never experienced Fallout 4. Do it, do it, play it. I probably will. I definitely right I, now. I, I probably not right now because we got the updates coming in a couple weeks. So Pull the podcast and play it right now. No. So kudos to Amazon. Kudos to everybody there. I, executive producer Todd Howard, uh, as he's credited in the in the show's uh, credits. Ooh. Yeah, they they absolutely nailed it, and they must know it's going to be a hit because it's already renewed for a season two. So I can't wait to where, you know, this the story continues to go. Um, the the power armor is pretty badass though, Jazz. I gotta say. Like yeah, it does look cool. Yeah, it's a little eh when he's like trying to fly around with it, but like the strength they show off, especially with the over the top gore. Jesus, the over the top gore in this game, or in 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 the show is so good. Just blood everywhere, you know? Yeah, I really want to watch it. Man, I'm getting excited about, like, later tonight, watching four episodes in a row and binging that shit in a day. Best way to experience a show, Paris. Where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to download it to my phone now that I've... And I'm going to watch it on the plane. Yeah, good old Conwood with the $2 says, Paris did binge watch Falls. Yes, he did. He had early access to it. Uh, in advance, so he did watch it over the course of some time. We're not going to hold that against him. Uh, we got 09 C Mine with the five dollars. Ran per your recommendation, I caved in and bought Banishers: Ghosts of New Eden. I'm about ten hours in so far and absolutely love it. Awesome, I love to see that. I love awesome. to see that I'm just not crazy and like maybe maybe I'm crazy. Maybe this game was. Maybe you good. are crazy. Maybe I'm good, maybe but no, Banishers was a really really good game. It's a game not a lot of people talk about, um, and I understand like it's still sixty bucks. It'll probably be on sale eventually, but I think it's definitely worth a playthrough. Uh, we got Mister Nintendo Donataku with the five it says, "Talk about Gio Corsi, former PlayStation director of third-party games, joining Nintendo, and how Switch Two will have more third-party support than Xbox." Oh, you. Oh, you. I don't think that's true. <laughs> what that Geo Corsi joined Nintendo, or that it'll have more third-party support? That will have more third-party support. Eh. I don't think so. Well, I mean, you know, if 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 the rumors are true and the Switch Two is about a level of a PS4 and Xbox, eh, it'll definitely get it definitely get more of the AAA games that skip the yeah, Switch. But what if the next Xbox runs Steam? Then you won't want for a game ever again. What do you mean? Because every every game will be on Xbox if it's running Steam. Yeah, but I mean, you're not. Yeah, but that's not on Xbox. That's on Steam. It's just a PC. Then. Yeah, but yeah, but Steam. If Steam is on Xbox, then you can play it on your Xbox. Yeah, but that's on that's through Steam. That's not. That's not. Yeah, but it's on your Xbox. Xbox. Yeah, but it's on your Xbox. So. Is so it gonna, is it going to have Xbox achievements? Who cares? No one cares about achievements. Okay, well then. <laughs> so then, so then, what you're saying is why why should developers even make third party games if they know everybody's just gonna have buy it from the Steam? Well, yeah, man, that's the that's the discussion, isn't it? I mean, that's what you're saying. Like, you can just buy this 
So is Microsoft going to be selling an Xbox or a Steam box? Well, we're going to talk about that in a bit, I think. Uh, we have, let's see here. We have Equinox with the 50. Uh, I'm not sure what currency this is. It says MAD, but I'm not sure what that is. Hi, friends. It's a mad currency. Add Mobuck from my community. Congratulations on your excellent podcast. Thank you. What do you think, Rand, of Jeff Grubb's leak drama? Oh, boy. I guess it's the Dead Space 2 stuff. There's a lot of um, a lot of drama regarding this. Can we talk about it now? Or the next topic? Oh, well, let's talk about it now. Talk about Dead Space 2, shall we? Yeah, so uh, we touched upon earlier on that EA is on the shit list. Yes. And it's because of stuff like this. <laughs> it's because of... So I... I love Dead Space. Dead Space 1 and 2... Not perfection, but two of the best survival horror action-y games you could ever ask for. And as we know, EA remade them. Uh, Motive, the studio behind it, remade Dead Space 1. And they did such a good job actually adding things onto the story, changing some... They didn't really even change things around. Like, Isaac didn't talk in the OG game, but Isaac talks in this one. And it just... It's right. And the remake was so good, it stuck to make what made Dead Space Dead Space. And it got everybody thinking about, okay, what's next from the studio and from Dead Space? Because clearly this is a franchise that EA liked at one point, and then they decided to bring it back, hoping that there would be some sort of swell of love for it, that people were like, okay, it's back, let's support it this time. And in my eyes, it was like, well, if you're remaking Dead Space 1, you have to remake Dead Space 2. Because Dead Space 2, in some ways, is better than Dead Space 1. Right? I know some people were like, well, Dead Space 1 is more survival horror, and Dead Space 2 is kind of more action-y survival horror. I know a lot of the comparisons are like, Dead Space 1 is Resident Evil 2, while Dead Space 2 is kind of more Resident Evil 3-y. Right? But I've always... Yeah. I love both those games, and if you ask me on different days, I'll tell you like one of them might be my favorite over the other one. But there are some moments in Dead Space 2 that I would, would want to see remade, considering how well that studio did that game justice. So in my mind, I'm like, oh man, we're going to get a Dead Space 2 remake. So my plan, or at least my thought process was, remake Dead Space 1, remake Dead Space 2, and make a new game for the third one. You don't need to remake Dead Space 3 because it's not that good. Right? And I'll die on that hill. Because I've seen Gene Park say Dead Space 3 is good. And I'm just like, no, Gene, it's not. <laughs> it is definitely not good. I mean, for a Dead Space yeah. game, it is definitely not good. At least not uh, uh, up there with the other two previous games. Um, but there's a report from Jeff that basically said... Dead Space 2 isn't happening, and it's been shelved or canceled, and all that sort of stuff, which was, like, so frustrating, because it's like, EA, damn it, I trusted you, and this is how you repay me, because I got my hopes up that we're going to get a Dead Space 2 or whatever, and it's not to be, of course, because they're EA, and they always do fucked up shit like this. They get you excited about... Oh, we're doing single player again. And it's like, but then they're like, haha, no, we're not. Fuck you. Go buy some microtransactions and FIFA Ultimate Team and Madden Ultimate Team or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But they always they always go through these things. Like, ah, we brought back Mirror's Edge. Ah, fuck you. We're done with Mirror's Edge. Right? Yeah. And then Jason Schreier came out and he was basically or no, EA came out and said that Jeff's report was wrong. And then Jason Schreier came out and basically was like, they weren't doing Dead Space 2. They actually were thinking about doing like a de like a new Dead Space game. But either way, they're not working on Dead Space anymore because they've been transitioned to working on Battlefield. So there was a whole drama between <laughs> Jason Schreier and Jeff Grubb and what was said or what wasn't said. But the core of the matter is that Motive is now working on Iron Man, and we've already seen EA say that they don't want to work on licensed games anymore. So I wonder what's going to happen after they ship this Iron Man game. Are they going to do an Iron Man 2, or are they just going to move that team to Battlefield as well? 
And, like, the Dead Space team is now on Battlefield. Now, we've seen them just cancel a studio that was working on a Battlefield single-player game in Ridgeline that hadn't even shipped the game. Now we have Motive, who did this incredible Dead Space remake, who either wanted to do Dead Space 2 or do a new Dead Space game, uh, basically being like, no, 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 no. You're doing a, a, something for Battlefield, which goes to your point of, like, a lot of these publishers and a lot of these developers are risk-averse. And, you know... A, dead sp- a new Dead Space game or Dead Space remake maybe risk is risky. But you know what's not risky? Battlefield, right? And now I'm just wondering. I'm now I'm just thinking of of the countdown for Motive to get shut down because it's very because it, to me it's just like the same path that Visceral walked. Visceral yeah. did Dead Space One, Dead Space Two, Dead Space Three. They iced the franchise. They were moved on to Battlefield. They did Battlefield Hardline. And then they were completely shut down. And now here's Motive. Oh, <laughs> and they're doing Dead Space 1 remake alongside an Iron Man game. Now they're moved to Battlefield. And what's the future going to hold? Especially if they're saying IPs aren't the future of what they want to do. So I would imagine once Iron Man's done, they're done with that. And I'm sorry, as good as Battlefield is, nobody gives a shit about Battlefield single player. Because most of the time, they're awful. And you won't ever bring back Bad Company. Because the time it actually was good with Battlefield, Bad Company 1 and 2, you dropped it completely. The Battlefield single-player campaigns are, tr- are, are awful. Especially compared to their competitor, Call of Duties, who usually, most of the time, are pretty good. And have been, although, you know, re- re- last one wasn't good, but... Uh, there is a staggering gulf of quality between the Call of Duty campaigns and the Battlefield campaigns, and there always has been, except for like when it was Bad Company 1 and Bad Company 2. So I don't expect much from this Battlefield single-player campaign, and I don't think people give a shit about What people want from Battlefield is large 128-player uh, battles and maybe a Battle Royale or whatever. They don't care about a single-player, but you know EA wants it. So EA is going to get it. So we lose Dead Space over it so they can chunk out a Battlefield campaign that nobody's going to play and nobody's going to remember and the studio will be shut down soon after. I hate this, Jez. It makes me makes me angry at EA that we have to go I through this your, again. I hate that you're predicting the future right now. It does really feel like that, doesn't it? I um, This is this thing about EA. It's just a lack of consistency. It's like... I don't think they marketed Dead Space very well, for one thing. I don't think a lot of people knew that it was, you know, a true, like, remake. I think a lot of people thought it was like a HD remaster kind of thing. I don't think they really pushed it in the same way that... I mean, it was kind of up against it to start with, because the difference between Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 2 Remake is massive because Resident Evil 2 is a PS1 game, for God's sake. But Dead Space 1 had, like, the FPS boost and all that kind of stuff and already kind of had, like, a next-gen version. And it held up pretty well. So I so I kind of feel like the purchasing power of a Dead Space Remake You've got to set your expectations appropriately. If they'd have done Dead Space 4, I think it would have been a different situation because people would have been like, well, yeah, Dead Space 4, that's new, right? But, man, I just kind of think that EA is just, just not capable of delighting its fans, really. You know, like the, you got Dead Space on life. Uh, you got Battlefield on life support right now. Um, you've got Bioware on life support. Like, what is what is Bioware gonna look like if if um, Dragon Age Dreadwolf flops? Right? <laughs> Not good. Not good. You know. Um, but Dead Space was really awesome. Dead Space remake was really really good, but. I don't know, man. It's it's tough because at the same time, it's like we keep being told that single player games don't work. Maybe the market's only big enough for Resident Evil. I don't know. It's a weird situation, man. I mean, it sucks, bro. Like seriously, it sucks. Ugh, it the fact that it's like, I mean, at least we got to have a remake of Dead Space One, which was pitch perfect. 
but the studio either wasn't able to then kind of do what they wanted to do, which was like a brand new Dead Space game, which I would have been excited to see either way. Even if it was like, I mean, granted, I wanted to see a Dead Space 2 remake, but if they were like, oh, we got a brand new Dead Space game, I would have been like, all right, yeah, sure, cool. Like, because I said my plan was always Dead Space 1, Dead Space 2, and then new Dead Space game. Um, And, I mean, I know they're going to bl- – we have a super chat here from Champagne Supernova. If not enough people bought Dead Space, is it damn you EA or damn those who didn't buy it? Ooh, ooh. Yeah, I mean, they say it didn't – Um, you know, it was, was, wasn't was a sales – a winner i guess or had 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 lackluster sales but it always just reminds me of like every time square enix is involved with one of their games it's like oh didn't meet expectations you know for any of their titles that they put out it's like well what, what were your expectations and i understand like hey games take a lot of money to make now so you know expectations are higher than ever and dead space was kind of always a cult hit anyways and it was like okay it went away for a long time and now it's back but it's not like it really grew in popularity by the time when it was gone. Like Gigantic coming back is kind of a it's kind of a weird one. Like Gigantic, and Gigantic isn't a game that even had the cult love that Dead Space had. At least Dead Space was sort of mainstream to a certain extent, where like Gigantic wasn't. But then like Gigantic comes and then it was like gone right away, and now it's back again. And I just kind of wondered, like, how's that gonna play out? Are we gonna get? an announcement in six months that nobody's playing gigantic and we need to shut down the servers again or something, you know? Well, they've done it a bit differently for gig- the gigantic remake. It's, it's not free to play now. It's like a buy, buy yeah, it's own. 20 bucks. And I think it's, but I think it's peer to peer as well. So the servers oh, right. are right. L- less overheads, but anyway, um, yeah, it is, it is weird how like, Different studios have different expectations for success. Like, the, there are rumors right now that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth only sold 2 million copies. Yeah, I don't only believe sold. It. I mean, only sold, which would be, if that's the case, that is a far drop from Final Fantasy XVI and Final Fantasy VII Remake. Remake sold 3.5 million in three days. And uh, I think 16 sold 3 million in a week, maybe it was. So if, like, Rebirth only sold 2 million in a month then that is a severe drop-off uh, between mm. uh, the, the, the one and the sequel. So, And we don't know what the sales numbers are. I think they're using player counts. Is that accurate? I don't really know. But Square Enix hasn't said anything, and normally they do. So the longer they stay quiet, the more it looks like the game didn't perform well or didn't meet their expectations. But then, once again, it's Square Enix, and their games never meet their expectations. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I have seen that report going around and it's, I'm surprised that Square hasn't said anything about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Yeah. Like how's the door gaming in chat says the silence says it all. Yeah. I mean, if it was super successful, they would have said something. If it, even if it was slightly under Rebirth, you know, remake or 16, I think they would have said something. The fact that they, it's been this amount of time and they haven't said anything probably, indicates that it's not close to whatever remake in 16 did but hey i mean m ships the future man hey you that's what be you, on everything you, everywhere. you take you take the money you pay you pay you gotta you gotta you know go with the consequences right you took the money yeah. from playstation it was a ps5 exclusive you know they didn't buy it and it didn't do well and it hurts the brand then it hurts the brand you know like yeah. at least it should have been PC day one. A shame. It should have been PC day one at least. At the very minimum. I'm not I'm not advocating for like it needs to be on Xbox. Like that should have shit should have been on PC day one at least. It would have done it way have better. But realistically, <laughs> the future is everything everywhere. Games, PlayStation, everywhere Switch, Switch Two, once. Xbox, PC. You want to get the, the most bang for your buck? That's how to do it. But I get it. Sometimes you're just like, oh, we don't want to have to pay for it. Let somebody else pay for it. Okay, well, somebody else paid for it. And now the Final Fantasy brand might be a little bit damaged because of it. Mm. You know, those are the trade-offs you got to make, I suppose. <sighs> yeah, Dead Space 2, I saw that. That just hurt. That hurts me. That hurts me, Jazz. Now, not like EA... They used to be on my. What do we? What do we determine the opposite of a shit list was? Did we? Did Chad ever come up with a? 
Hero list. I saw Hero list. Because they used to be like, oh like man, that. we got the we got the Jedi Survivor games. You know, it's like, oh, they brought back this. They're doing Dead Space. Yeah, and it's like it's a it's probably only a matter of time before they stop doing Jedi as well, right? If they're already talking about IPs and how licensed IP isn't the way forward, then I can imagine the, this next Jedi game from them from Respawn is probably the last. I mean, we, we already saw the game director Stig leave to form another studio. So, you're dead. And it's and it's not like Respawn's going to be making a Titanfall three anytime soon. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, single player is just dead at EA again for the third time or how many times it's been, it seems. Anyways, speaking of another IP, Jez, another licensed IP, Star Wars Outlaws. Star Wars Outlaws. Had its uh, story reveal trailer and a release date attached to it. It's coming out on, on August 30th. But if you pay extra money, all the way up to $120, you could play it three days early Uh, on August 27th, which is my birthday. So it'll be a good birthday present, guys, if you're paying attention. You know, my birthday, Star Wars Outlaws, you know, but, you know, put put one and one together, maybe, you know what I'm saying? What, how, what, what's your feeling on Star Wars Outlaws? Because I'm, you know, I kind of feel like... The Ubisoft formula is played We've out. talked about this before. It's played out. The Ubisoft yeah. formula is played out. But maybe the Star Wars twist, oh, authentic you, Star Wars twist. Does on this it game might be... interest you? Because I know how Ubisoft is not a publisher you really like and you're really tired of the tropes in their games. Is the Star Wars IP enough for you to look at this game and be like, I'll give this one a try? Yeah, it is. It is honestly. Okay. I, I'm a, I'm a Star Wars guy at the end of the day, and yeah, I will give this the benefit of the doubt because it's Star Wars, and I think a lot of other people will as well. But mm-hmm. it's also it's also going to be one of them kind of things where it's like um, I'm going to be looking out for it. I've got I've got a low tolerance for for I don't know. Uh, boredom, Ubis- Ubi boredom. Ubi I'll boredom. Call it. U- Ubi boredom. I've got really low tolerance for it. You know the the sort of pointless quests and the the, the sort of like the checklists of things you have yeah, to do. Yeah, but I mean, you play World of Warcraft though. You should be used yeah, to that. Yeah, but World of Warcraft's also competitive, cooperative, five-player dungeon crawler kind of game. It's not really the same, Kettle of Fish. Kettle of fish? Is that the phrase? Uh, is it? I don't know. It's not really the same to kill a fish. Is that what you said? Is that the, is that the it's phrase? Ke- kettle, kettle of fish. It's kettle not the same of fish. Kettle, kettle. kettle of fish. What the hell? Kettle. Yeah. Kettle. What does that mean? A kettle. What's, you know, you put you you, you put, put your a fish in, in the kettle and then you you boil the fish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is, is this is this really is this a is this a, a UK saying of some kind? I've, I don't know. Kettle of fish. Kettle of fish. When I've Jez is just making stuff up. Okay, so there is a, there is a phrase, a pretty kettle of fish, but it's used in a completely yeah, different so you context. Just completely, so just... <laughs> <laughs> you just completely made it up. Oh, no, 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 it is a thing. It is a thing. A different kettle of fish is an alternative to what has been previously considered. A different thing altogether. Yeah, I didn't make it up. It is a thing. It is a thing. Screw you guys. Phrasefinder.org.uk. It is definitely a thing. <laughs> okay, but in the UK. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to. I had to double check that because I was like, did I just make that up? I was. I was. Uh, oh God. Anyway. Um. Yeah. I. I don't know. I. I I'm interested what chat thinks about this as well. And it is, it's Ubisoft Massive, right? If yes. I remember correctly. Yes, it is Ubisoft Massive's, Massive. Massive leading development. And honestly, Ubisoft Massive is probably like the, the, the studio that has produced the Ubisoft games that I enjoy the most. You know, like, like Division, the Division 1 and 2, Division, Avatar. Division 1 and 2, solid games. I haven't played Avatar. I don't care about Avatar. I, I actually despise Avatar as a, okay. as a franchise. I think oh. it's did it hurt I, you? I despise it, yeah. It it hurt me, yeah. What what did what did James it. Cameron do to you? 
I just think it's super cringe. You think it's just a retelling of Dances with the Wolves just, and I think it's it's derivative. It's right. Mm. It's bland. Mm. I hate Avatar, man. I hate it. And I don't know anyone that likes it. And I don't understand. I, have a I don't know where the... It. Where's the Avatar fandom? Like, it's almost like they're hiding. I don't know. This, I mean, mo- like, this franchise makes so much money, it, apparently. It sure does. It sure does. It's the highest grossing movies ever, essentially. I will agree with you that Avatar I... Avatar 1 was garbage. I, I agree I, with you. Avatar 1 was garbage. awful. Avatar 1 was completely... The whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, wait, am I watching Dances with Wolves? What's going on here? Because <laughs> it's just... I was sitting there thinking, did a child write this? You know, but hey, it's it it, it ushered <laughs> in the whole three D stuff, right? It looked pretty. I don't care. I will say, did Avatar it, did it look pretty? I don't it, think it looked, so. It looked really pretty, but Ava- I I did I think, think so. Avatar Two was way better. Meh. But I, I'm just saying, personally, I it's thought Avatar Smurfs. Two was way better. Joe jo, jo Repco in the chat in the chat says it's adult Smurfs. Um, yeah, essentially. I don't know. It's not really a unique story. It's a story no, it's, that's been done to death. It's derivative. It's derivative, man. But but yeah, so I'm not interested in Avatar games, but you know, Star Wars, totally original and completely not yeah, derivative. Yeah, totally at all. original. No, <laughs> didn't didn't steal anything from Dune at all. Not didn't steal anything from Dune, didn't steal anything from Akira Kurosawa either. Yeah. <laughs> completely original. <laughs> Which by the way, you watched Dune, didn't you? Yeah. Dune too, right? I did watch Dune too. Yeah. Spectacular, man. Spectacular. But again, it's 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 like you and your book. Now you now we've got to wait for the next one. Um, well, I mean, I already know what happens in the next one because I've read the book. I've read Dune Messiah. Yeah, I haven't read. I don't read no books, so I don't know what's going to happen. I I knew what's happened in the original just because everyone kind of knows, but I don't know what I don't know what happens from it. So I'm flying blind now. But it was it was such a spectacle. It was so good. Watch a big screen, Dolby Atmos. Mm. Just a, just a trip. Did, 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 did you get did you get you get some food to go along with? Did you go to the theaters that that delivers you some some goodies to go along? You know, I actually had popcorn for the first time in like twenty plus years. Really, and it made me really ill. Ooh, interesting. It made you ill. Yeah, it made me ill. Like it me re it, it, my entire digestive system just whew. backfired. But so, it wasn't a good yeah, choice. I, no, it wasn't. I I I had a, I had a stomach infection a few years ago, and since then, like loads of food impacts me in a weird way. Beans. I can only eat certain food. Yeah, it's because of all I, the beans you ate. Yeah, maybe I don't know, but but yeah, uh, I'm interested in Star Wars Outlaws. I I like to see where it goes, and I hope it's successful, and I hope it breaks the Ubisoft. I hope it breaks my personal Ubisoft stigma because a, a lot of it is a me problem. You know, and I'm not saying the Ubisoft games are bad necessarily, and this isn't an attack on anyone who does like those games. And like, I've got like my best friend loved Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and she put like hundreds and hundreds of hours into that game. You know, it's it's definitely a me thing. You know, and part of it is it, part of the stigma is having to play Ubisoft games for work and having to force myself through them. You know, when I'm not enjoying it. So I know it's definitely a me thing. So I'm hoping that I'm hoping this breaks my personal stigma over Ubisoft. I, you know what? I was actually hoping that Skull and Bones would break the stigma, but Skull and Bones yeah. was terrible, mm. absolutely awful. So yeah, you <laughs> try again with that. <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah, I. I mean, I like Star Wars too. So, Star Wars Outlaws is a game on my list. I I hopefully don't run afoul of like the Ubisoft fatigue open world stuff, which is I'm kind of going to manage myself because I am going to be playing Rebirth because I just finished Remake and I know that's big open world. And I still got Cyberpunk to play and that's kind of open that's open world too. And like I said, I love the Fallout TV show so much. It's gotten me like wanting to play the game and that's open world. So I'm just kind of just, and I know if I play too many open world games in a row, I get burnt out on them, but it is a game coming out in August and it's like, all right, I'm going to play this. But it's weird because the discussion surrounding this game isn't really about the game itself or about 
the discussion of paying for early access because that's always kind of been a uh, a talking point, right? Oh, are you know, is this really right? Should people really be paying for early access? Is this just a way for them to sell us more expensive versions of a game, right? Like people talk about $70 isn't enough, so now they're selling $120 versions of a game that you get three days early access and extra stuff. Is this a way to inflate the price? It's bullshit that people can play it early. Like there's that whole discussion about paying extra to play it early. But then it really did seem like the discussion about this game was strictly focused on the character, the girl's looks in the game. Very much kind of similar to Stellar Blade in a way. Stellar Blade was focused on, you know, the look of the main character in that game. And then the talk about Star Wars Outlaws was based around the look of the main character versus the actress playing her. And that really seemed to dominate the discussion about Star Wars Outlaws. Mm. I, I, there's a part of there's a part of like the game discussion about this stuff has really just gone off off the rails. It's like you're not talking about like oh how the game might play or will this have come to the Ubisoft stuff. It's some superfluous other tangent that doesn't really have anything to do with the game. That is what people get you know the outrage machine kind of rolls in behind. I'm I'm sure you saw some of that, right? Yeah, I just ignore it because a lot of it is just Twitter. Like these discussions would never happen in real life because people would be embarrassed to have them. Mm. I just, it's just not real. It's not real. It's not, not interesting. No, it's not interesting to me. Okay, fair enough. Um, I I had this in here because maybe you would like this, but. The developers of Kingdom Come Deliverance, Warhorse Studios, are revealing their new game on April 18th next week. Is that something you're interested in? Did uh, you play Kingdom, Kingdom Come, Come Deliverance? Because I didn't. I I did play it a bit. I didn't play it too much. I think my, one of my colleagues was handling it. I was handling something else at the time, and it just kind of slipped off my radar. Um, I do have colleagues that really, really love that game. Um and stuff like that and they did support it really well i actually can't t- talk too much about the sequel <laughs> for reasons oh um uh or, or the the rumored sequel i should say okay um but you know i i keep an eye out i would say. <laughs> keep an eye out we will keep an eye out so if anybody's interested in seeing what warhorse is making after kingdom come deliverance that's being revealed on april 18th and there's a little bit of news about Ori 3, which is surprising because we know that Moon Studios is making for, uh, was for the Wicked or, no, what's the name of the game? No Rest for the Wicked. And that's launching into early access on Steam, I think next week. Um, looks really good. I know you played a little bit of the preview of the game. But Game Informer interviewed... Thomas Mahler and talked about a third installment of Ori. So I'll just read some of the quotes here because he said that he says, I have a title for the game already. I have some ideas, but so far right now we're completely focused on no rest for the wicked. And he says, as for why moon studios decided to develop a new IP instead of a third Ori, uh, they say, I think we were able to complete the story of Ori. It's a complete arc now. If you play both games, it's a complete story. So it felt like the only way we would come back to Ori 3 is if we have more to say with more story to tell. So Mm. seeing this as someone who loves Ori and considers it one of the best, uh, especially Ori World of the West, one of the best games of last generation, definitely the best game Xbox put out. I am very much of two minds on this one because I don't really feel that Ori needs a sequel because of how they wrapped everything up and just how close to perfect Ori and the Will-O-Wisps is. But if they were to return to it, I wouldn't necessarily be against that idea because maybe they could top it. And they do leave that slight window open at the very end of the game for a potential 
another game. I so I my two selves are kind of fighting because I'm like, no, let it lie. It was as good as it could be. It's like the guy said, it's a complete story told between those two games. It's 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 nice bit packaged together. It's like don't ruin the legacy because if you're gonna come and 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 do another Ori game, it has to be as good as the previous ones. Like you cannot come and do an Ori game and have it just be mediocre. It has to live up to those. But it's like okay, well if you're gonna, because there was always the rumors like oh they're gonna do an Ori three, but it's gonna be made by somebody else. And I'm like well, what? Like that didn't that doesn't really seem right to me because it's like no. It, I'm not saying it necessarily has to be made by Moon Studios, but like Moon Studios has proven that they are, when it comes to that franchise, they know what they're doing. And I feel like, all right, if you brought another studio on, would it be as good? Because it has to be. You can't have something that is like, that is as close to perfect as you can get and then come in and like, well, actually, it's just, just okay. Because then it would ruin the whole legacy of the series. But if they already are saying, like, we have a title for it, and we have some ideas, but we're focused on this thing, it's like, all right, well, maybe you could tell a story for the third game, and then make it, like, a complete trilogy. So, like, there, I don't want to get, ex- like, part of me is, like, gets gonna get ex- would get excited about it, but the other part of me is like, no, 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 don't ruin it as perfect the way it is. I don't know. I, I know you don't really care about Ori, like, the way I do. So I like Ori. You do? Okay. Yeah, I reviewed both of them. Gave them both. I think I gave both of them 10 out of 10, I think. I think I gave Ori 2 9 out of 10 because it was a bit it was a bit rough at launch. Yeah, it had some performance problems. Yeah, but I love those games. I love Metroidvania games. Well, what do you think? Do you, I'd love to see, I'd, I'd should... love to see a third one, but like you, I'm in two minds, you know. Ended really per- on a perfect note, um, but there's no there's no game like it. There's no game that handles, like, the platforming that well in a Metroidvania kind of world. But at the same time, Hollow Knight's going to scratch that itch for me, I think, very soon. Yeah, but Hollow Knight's um, not not Ori, though. It no, is a Metroidvania, not. but it's not Ori. It's not Ori, but it's going to scratch the itch for me, I think. At least for me. At least for you. Yeah, uh, Donataku in the Super Chat with the five. He says, I hate how people hate on the Ubisoft formula while praising games like Ghost of Tsushima and Horizon Forbidden West that does the exact same thing with worse gameplay but more polish. Damn. Well, I haven't played either of those. So, well, I've played I played Horizon very briefly, but yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I can't really comment beyond that. Mm. I haven't played them. Well, I mean, I haven't played Horizon, so I'm not really sure either. But Ghost of Tsushima? Yeah, I mean, even playing Ghost of Tsushima, you knew you knew it was basically a Ubisoft game just made by PlayStation, but PlayStation did it better. <laughs> I mean, what else is there to say? Yeah. I mean, Ghost of Tsushima, yes, it is. it has icons everywhere and all that. The time wasters that you can do like in the Ubisoft games, absolutely. But I think because it tells a better story, a more emotional story, and it has that polish and production that sometimes the Ubisoft games lack. People, well, it also let's not talk. Let's not say like the when Ghost of Tsushima came out, it wasn't like it was lauded as like the next big thing. It got like an eighty-two on Metacritic, even though it was nominated for Game of the Year. It it still reviewed low eighties. Now the you know uh not Hi-Fi Rush but Horizon Forbidden West. He says here. Um, I don't know. I haven't played those, but yeah, a lot of a lot of Sony open world games. I mean, a lot of open world games. Period. Take a lot from the Ubisoft formula. Ubisoft kind of patented it, and everybody looked at that and was like, "Oh, we're just going to take things from it." But Ubisoft. I'm not saying Ubisoft was the first to do open worlds, but a lot of the mechanics that they introduced in their games were really compelling when they first did it. That most open world games just copy what Ubisoft did. Yeah, um, you know, and Sony put their spin on it, or uh, Sucker Punch put their spin on it, and Gorilla put their spin on it, and other studios put their spin on that formula, and it sometimes it makes you forget those. 
So, uh, what do we got here, Jez? We have, um, I don't know, someone sent me this. So, I'll just read this. I'm not sure how true this is. But do you know uh, Rebs Gaming on Twitter, Mr. Rebs? I know of him. So, he put out a video. He says, here's my exclusive video report about how former 343 Industries leadership ruined Halo Infinite's campaign development. Um, and he has, some, he, has, he has some checklists or some checkpoints here. I'm going to just read this to you, see what you think, see if this is similar to what you have heard. He says, the campaign team was placed in a box without studio collaboration, which drained the team, which I think you have mentioned that like the teams were siloed, right? Yeah, I heard that the teams were siloed. So the campaign didn't receive any external focus testing unlike previous campaigns, and this pissed off the team. Uh, yeah, that scans. Okay. I was told that um, feedback, even the feedback they did get, was ignored. Uh, he says, leadership didn't play the campaign during internal testing days and eventually canceled internal testing, which cut off all feedback loops for the campaign team. I've heard a lot about feedback with Halo, and feedback was a big problem, so that scans. So leadership didn't ask for campaign feedback until months before the game shipped. And hackathons were created to boost morale. Several awesome prototypes were created, but leadership abruptly scrapped them and the hackathons. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned before how hard it is to paint a, a complete picture of what happened to 343 because people were siloed, for one thing. And people were siloed, for one thing. And also, everyone's got a different perception of what went wrong. It feels like everyone put the blame on different teams, different people, different individuals. So I couldn't build up a complete narrative. And I think that speaks for itself in what kind of a mess development of that game was on. And I've said before, like I know people who quit the entire game industry and changed careers because of their work on Halo Infinite. But it does sound like, you know... The game's in a better place now. The team's moving in all one direction now. And hopefully, the future of Halo will look better with a leaner team, maybe. That was all pulling in one direction rather than this sort of strange operation they had before where it's like you got, you know, a franchise manager and doing this and that and the other. And it's all sort of like, you know, different leaders, too many chefs in the kitchen kind of scenario. I don't know, man, but. Halo fans deserve better. Halo fans deserve better. Well, I mean, hey, is... people talk about how the multiplayer is in a great spot. Yeah, but what if you're someone who doesn't really care about the multiplayer? Because I feel like there's, there's two different kinds of Halo player, potentially, or three, maybe. There's people who like all th both aspects of it. There's people who like the multiplayer aspect of it, and there's people who like the campaign aspect of it, and the lore and all that kind of stuff. I kind of feel like people who've, who've been hoping for... Halo's campaign to be serviced properly. I've been waiting since, God, Halo 4? Maybe even earlier than that. Halo Reach? I don't know. I don't know, man. But hopefully things get to a better place with Halo because it is the brand. Like, Microsoft put out an ad with Master Chief on it the other day. Like, Master Chief is the iconic, the iconic thing. You know, the, the, the sort of... You, you think of Xbox when you think of Master Chief, you know, and for Microsoft to have fumbled all that is kind of lame. And Johnny Cousins in chat says, revisionist history of the campaign was bad. It wasn't bad, but you've got to admit, they left it unfinished. There's plot points in that campaign which are never going to be addressed. That, that, that game was des clearly designed for DLC, and the fact they called it infinite and it's not infinitely expanding says it all, you know, like the end the, I wouldn't be surprised if the next Halo completely forgets the endless even existed. You know, I would not be surprised at all, you know, and it, it's kind of annoying that like these plot threads never get addressed in the games. Like maybe they'll get addressed in a book or something like that, you know, but it's whatever, man. Um, I ain't reading no Halo books, personally. Mm. Do you read the Halo books, Ryan? No, I've never read a Halo book. So, yeah, we we talked yes, we talked with John on Tuesday about 
what he thinks you know the future of Halo should be. We've talked about that before, but I I saw this pop up because Yaquin Jaquin sent it to me, so I figured, all right, let's let's, let's see what this what what some of this is. But um, yeah. Jez, you wrote an article this past week that got picked up by a lot of people about how uh, Xbox president Sarah Bond has set up a new team dedicated to game preservation and forward compatibility. And I wanted you to explain this to, to people, to myself, what this, re- what this really means. What, what's going on at Xbox? Why do you have to set up a team for forward compatibility and all this sort of stuff? Are they, is this a signal they're moving from X86 to ARM? Uh, no, I don't, this... I don't. That was that was a reach by me. That 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 they'd moved to ARM. You know, um, they they explored ARM, and I think that's like that's kind of like. Oh, I'll I'll go through the the article in general. So, oh, yeah. last week was it last week or this week? I have no perception of time. You or... you dropped us the day after our podcast. You dropped us on Saturday last week. Yeah. So Sarah Bond. Um, too bad you couldn't do this on our show last week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, gotta gotta bring the bacon to Windows Central sometime. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, Sarah Bond. I I got wind of some emails that Sarah Bond has sent out to the Eternal team talking about uh, the big biggest technological leap for hardware um, for the next Xbox console, but also that they've set up a team dedicated to forward compatibility and game preservation, right? And that kind of got me thinking about what the next Xbox is going to look like, coupled with teases from Phil and the Polygon interview where he's talking about Epic Game Store and Xbox and all that kind of stuff. Also, FTC leaks from last year, Microsoft exploring using ARM chips for the Xbox console. And I kind of just put all my thoughts out, laid them all on the table, and just thought, like, what could the next Xbox look like? So I think... I think Phil talking about Epic Game Store and itch.io, which is another PC game store on Xbox, is not that's not just a, a theory in his head. I think that's that's think, a plan. I think Phil's basically telling you what the future of Xbox looks like. Yeah, Phil's like, telling the, you what the future is. That of whole Xbox Polygon like. article where he talked about the handheld and he talked about the stores, I think he's literally laying laying out to people what the future of Xbox hardware looks like, right? And what could be yeah. in, yeah, that's, he's, oh, not, he's, 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 I don't know. He wasn't very, uh, what's the, wasn't he, subtle. yeah, he wasn't very subtle with that. I think he's like literally laying it out there. Yeah. Phil, Phil even said in my previous interview that when he t- talks like these and these teases, you can take them as like that. There's something more. And I think that put, he frames them like this because maybe they, it doesn't pan out and maybe they change. Maybe they change direction down the line or somewhere like that. I don't know. But I think you can take what he said about Epic Game Store and Xbox as being um, part of the plan right now, right? And you have to extrapolate from that that if Epic Game Store is going to be an Xbox, then probably Steam's going to be an Xbox too. Um, and that Xbox development will be closer to Windows than ever before. And that's not to suggest... I don't think that it's going to be like all the way to the point where you're booting Xbox onto the desktop. It's still going to be like a stripped down operating system. It's still going to be simple. It's still going to be a console experience in my view, because that's what a console is. And like, if you are, you know, someone who's inclined towards that, then they can just go and buy a PC today. The whole point of a console is that it works well with a controller. It works well on a TV. It's got big fonts and a big UI for a big TV. And also you don't have to, jump through hoops, drivers, device manager, updates, and all that kind of stuff. Like recently, for example, my Lenovo Legion Go got a BIOS update, right? Mm-hmm. And it has been a nightmare because it's reset uh, it's reset the, the v, my VRAM allocation and all this kind of stuff. So I have to go back through the BIOS menu, tweak stuff, and then come back out, check that the games work again, and all this kind of stuff. That's not a console experience. And these like devices like the Asus ROG Ally, the Nova Legion Go, they're great, but it's not a console experience. You have to be familiar with Windows to really get the most out of these devices. Like you have to be willing to learn stuff like, oh, I can change the VRAM allocation 
on these devices because by default the vram allocation set pretty low and that and some games like you know god of war for example they want a lot of vram you know and the last of us they want a lot of vram and they'll throw you a warning if you don't have enough vram you don't want that from your console experience so um so yeah i think the next xbox will be closer to windows development and developers will be able to make one version of a game for pc win 32 and xbox and it will just work and the whole idea of this game preservation platform is that whatever the next xbox looks like from a development development point of view developers making games for xbox one and xbox series s and x in the next xbox they will still run on the next xbox and those apis will line up you know now the stuff with arm that was kind of like more pie in the sky because I don't think ARM is powerful enough right now to really give a great gaming experience. I think like some of the some of the videos out there of the latest ARM chip show Baldur's Gate running between twenty and thirty frames, pretty unstable, you know. So like for those who don't know, ARM is like a processor architecture from um, a British company called ARM Holdings, and a lot of companies build their processors on ARM architecture, like the Apple Apple chips in the MacBooks are now ARM-based. And the, the advantage of ARM is that it's really power efficient. So you get better battery life without potentially sacrificing power. But the problem is, uh, at least for Windows and Xbox, is that you have to use some of that efficiency to emulate things, right? Because you have if you haven't developed... If you haven't developed uh, a native game for ARM, then you need to emulate it, right? Which is where the game preservation and forwards compatibility comes in. But I do think future handhelds could use ARM as the you know the technology improves, and eventually maybe you get handhelds that do have eight hours of battery life and that can do you know sixty frames, ten eighty p, or more. You know, that's kind of where that angle was coming from. I think the next Xbox will be mostly a traditional kind of thing. I don't. I think it'll still be probably AMD. I think it'll still be you know powerful. I think it'll still be comparable to PlayStation in power, maybe more exceed PlayStation in power even. Um, but I do think you know when Phil's talking about Steam and Epic Game Store, that's a hint that that's what they're doing. And I know you've got some thoughts about this, right? Yeah. I mean, sure. I guess you're not a big fan of it, right? No, it's not that it's not that I'm a the I mean number 1, I don't know how it's going to be implemented. A lot of it has to do with like implementation. How easy it would it be to access Steam uh from from the device? I I just have questions cuz I'm not sure how like Xbox and Phil constantly talks about in these interviews where it's like about getting new new players and new users. I'm just not sure how having PC stores on your Xbox is going to actually bring you any more users. Now, sure, you could say, well, they could sell the box to PC players who want, like, an experience on their big screen TV, and that could be really cool. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. But unless you're selling that box for profit right away, uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because, as we know, as they constantly say, selling the box isn't the business. Like, the business is selling services and and and, and you know, games. So it's like if you're tr- going to sell it to PC people so they can have an easy, like, oh, let me experience my games on a big screen and, you know, my, my C- C4 or whatever, my 77-inch that I can't, you know, it's far away from my PC. But then that person who buys it isn't going to actually spend any money on your store because they're just going to keep on buying from Steam. Unless, like you're saying, Microsoft was going to work out some deal with Steam where, like, anybody who buys anything from the Steam store on Xbox... Microsoft gets like a 10% kickback or something. Um, Cause I just don't see how it brings in, it would bring in any new players that would want to spend money on the Xbox store or even like the idea of like, all right, well it's really easy to access steam on this Xbox device. And we already see some developers are kind of like if he with supporting Xbox with some, some games, they just may never Unless they get the Game Pass back, they just be like, it's not worth it for us because we know these Xbox customers are going to have a store where they can buy this game. So we're just not going to even bother. We're, we can save on dev costs and just not 
even bother making an Xbox version of this game. So I don't know. There's a, it's too much like pie in the sky. I would need to see like what's how I don't know how everything's like ex- explained out and everything because it's just it's just weird because they talk about like new players all the time and I struggle to see how exactly this is going to bring in new people into no, but, the, the platform. I, dude, I don't know. But it's new players for the games. The business is selling games. Right. And it doesn't I get that. matter what store they're in. You but, know. But doesn't it? I mean, I, no. And I'll tell you why. So wait, a lot so, of people so don't are you realize saying, are this. Are you saying like Microsoft is doing it out of the, the charity of their own heart to make sure that the games that aren't theirs find also a bigger audience? like no they're not doing it at a charity but i think the, there's there's a couple of aspects of this a it gives xbox platform potentially playstation games potentially oh okay so like so like you know if if xbox can run steam you no longer have an argument that xbox doesn't have all the games because xbox will have all the games okay it'll be cheaper than pc you know, presumably they'll be, be cheaper than. Well, okay, the actual five hundred six hundred dollar box. Yeah. Sure, sure, it'll be cheaper than PC. That yeah, it'll be cheaper than PC. And presuming Sony doesn't block their oh. games on Steam on Xbox, and they could, but I don't think they would, to be honest, because that money wouldn't be going directly to Microsoft. It gives Microsoft some, ex- you know, it gives Microsoft dif- strong differentiation strong differentiation against PlayStation in that scenario. Microsoft still gets to sell its games, right? And see, people in the chat are already talking about the 30% cut, but this is this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize right now, is that the margins on selling your game on a third-party store are closing in on the margins of operating your own store. It is not free to operate your own store. It is expensive. You have to pay for support staff. You have to pay for servers. You have to pay for all this stuff. And these overheads eat into your margins. You know, So the margins on operating a third-party store, uh, putting your games on a third-party store, or operating your own store, they are getting smaller. So, like, it's not actually a big loss for Microsoft to put their games on Steam, you know, and maybe maybe there will be a kickback, like you say. Maybe they close the gap in the, yeah, in the difference in the margin, and there's still a difference, but it's shrinking. Maybe the difference is the kickback, you know, and Microsoft takes a little cut when a game is sold on their Xbox via Steam, right? And the Lord Henry says, how will it benefit Steam? Because they sell the games. They will sell the, sell the games and get people in their ecosystem. Yeah, but then you, you know, could like also if, make the counter, how does that benefit Xbox? How does that benefit, maybe that, how does that benefit Xbox maybe they get if a people kickback. are buying the device but then never spending money on the platform? Like, I mean, okay, because like, they will spend money on the platform. When they, they boot up their Xbox, they'll still see Xbox first. And people will still buy the Xbox console because it's an Xbox console. The people who will be buying into it, that ecosystem first, will be Xbox fans, and there's still millions of us. Sure, sure. There's still millions of us who are using Xbox every day and all that kind of stuff. But those games that won't come to Xbox, the games like your Genshin Impacts and your PlayStation games and all that kind of stuff... Genshin Impact even on Steam? No, but... Presumably, this would be able to run the Genshin Impact launcher if it, you know, has those APIs from Windows. I don't know. That's that's a um, weird thing to say. Oh, by the way, we couldn't bring these games to Xbox, so just buy them on a different store that you can play on your Xbox. It's kind of like that's what Steam Deck does. Genshin Impact runs on Steam Deck, but you have to download the launcher for it. Mm. And is that bad for is that bad for Steam Deck? I don't see anyone's I don't see anyone out here saying like, oh, Steam Deck the Steam Deck model is stupid because I can install Battle.net on it. No? Well, the business is selling games. Sure, sure. The business is selling games. The business I hundred percent agree with the business is subs- services and subscriptions, but like I said, 
and it, when you listen to these interviews and Phil talks about like what's the driver behind all these things, it's about like finding new audiences and new players and stuff, which is why they're bringing games to PlayStation and games to Switch. And I don't know if you saw. Well, think if- of it this way, right? Think of it this way: if you get an Xbox that has the the right console that has the riot games launcher on it right uh-huh and you get you get valorant and all that kind of stuff but when you boot up the console the first thing you see is an ad for epic for xbox game pass and it also says like all your riot games um all the riot games on this device you can get all the characters for free with pc game pass or or they'll just probably just call it xbox game pass at that point right so there's that kind of aspect to it too. It opens up a lot of scenarios for Microsoft to sell more games and ultimately have a healthier business. And I don't get why people in the chat are saying it feels like they're giving up on a console. We're literally talking about them making a console right now. It just does something a little bit different. The business is not selling hardware, it's selling games. And if Microsoft has the, the only console that can run Valorant, I think like that's going to add a lot of people to the ecosystem. And if those people subscribe to Xbox Game Pass to get the characters in Valorant, you can bet that they're going to try Xbox games natively because they'll have the subscription. And that's all we've seen that already happening on PC. So... Well, unless unless they decide unless Riot decides to bring Valorant natively to the console, anyways, which there are rumors that they are doing. Yeah, but they wouldn't ha- they wouldn't even have to make that effort in this. Well, that that's even yeah. my point about third party developers supporting Xbox. Like, why put the effort in when you already know everybody who has that uh, that device is going to be able to access Steam on it? Why even bother? That's, that that's potentially the risk. Well, but I mean, it in seems this... like a pretty goddamn huge risk to me. I don't think it's as big as a risk as you're imagining it to be. And also in this scenario, Xbox's licensing model would be closer to Windows as well. So like all those Xbox games, all the games that you own today, if they if they land this correctly, if they land it in the right way, all those Xbox games today will also run on Windows. So that also raises the profile of the Microsoft Store as a place where you can take advantage of sales you can take advantage of xbox game pass and there'll be there will be more games on your pc and there will be more games on on all your devices this is like this is like a platform thing now it's about selling more games sure sure and i think like in this scenario maybe i'm I'm just too stupid to see it look i'm not i'm not a smart person maybe i'm just too stupid to see it but i just don't see how it Doing that would lead to Microsoft, Xbox selling more games. I just don't. I maybe it will, and maybe it's like you know so creatively. It's like maybe the idea of like, okay, you got this device and it plays all your Xbox games, but then also you can play all this PC games and even all the PlayStation games because they're on Steam, and then so people buy this thing, and then by the virtue of having it, they actually then buy stuff on the xbox store like maybe maybe that's how it plays out and i'm just too dim-witted to understand the model and to understand the vision you know because i don't run a billion well, the, dollar the, business i the, the issue well this a hey, it is a billion dollar business and this is what people forget, i'm just saying maybe you know, i'm just i'm just too like dim-witted i don't know I, I i i don't know i just like I said, I guess it, I would need to see it all implemented and see how it would work. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it to me, it's just, to me, it's like <laughs> if you put this, if you put all that stuff there together, I feel like less well, people would. Well, put, well, think of it this way. How is it a bad thing, right? Say, for example, that um, less devs do support Xbox natively. You know, it's the worst case scenario. I don't think that's going to happen. And A... I think if Microsoft is going to do this, they would be going to Ubisoft, EA, and whoever and getting their express support. Yeah, yeah. We know how good the express support is because they they also had their express support of the DRM strategy with the Xbox One, and we all know how that turned out. 
Yeah, well, there's a certain company that blew that well, up. I'm just saying it doesn't matter if they have their express support now because they had their express support then. And then that basically just, like, it destroyed well, Xbox. They can't, they can't control that. I'm just saying, but anyway, like, having the express support of the publishers of this idea doesn't mean anything because they had the express support before and it blew up in their face. Well, it's, it's a different situation. You can't really, you can't really compare the two, to be honest. You know, you can't really say like this happened and this was bad. So this happened is going to no, happen again just, and it's going to be bad again. No, I, I, I it's get a completely that. different situation. I get that. I just, like I said, maybe I'm just too dim-witted to see it. Maybe I didn't You've see it in access. The Ste- I... Steam Deck is the template. Steam Deck is the template for how uh-huh. this is going to play out, right? And it's going to be like when you when you boot up a Steam Deck, you get you get Steam in your face. You can do other things with it but you don't because it's more convenient to just use Steam. This will be the similar scenario. And it'd be like, you boot it up, you get Xbox in your face. And all those casual gamers, they're just going to play mostly on Xbox. But like, they can, if they want, maybe boot up Steam on the side to get their well, that, God that of goes, War. That goes and all to that my stuff. original comment, is like, how is this implemented? If it's convoluted, where you have to jump through hoops to, to run Steam or Epic on here, then it's I don't think it'd be convoluted, but it will still be. It, they still won't be the default app you use to get games on Xbox. And all those millions of people who play Xbox today are still going to use Xbox. To, are you going to st- if on the next Xbox just because Steam is there? Are you just going to start using Steam for everything? I don't think so. No, I don't but, think it, but if else I is d- either. but but I I I have have I do have friends that were all Xbox this generation that have all moved to PC. Well, and one, well, they probably won't buy this device. And two, if they did buy this device, they certainly wouldn't buy games from the Xbox store on it. They would have on... bought the device, but they would yeah, have but bought the device. As you know, it's it's the the business isn't selling the console, so it doesn't matter if they bought the console if they didn't never spend any money on on uh, in the store, unless Xbox is getting oh. a kickback from people buying games on Steam from their store. Which why I don't even know which why Steam would be. even I don't even know why Steam would even agree to that. Well, maybe they would. I don't know. Maybe they would. You know. Um, I want to believe that Microsoft thought all about. This. I don't know, but doesn't but doesn't doesn't that make Steam the better proposition? Because like, if you buy a game on Steam, then not only can you play it on your beefy PC, you can then play it on your Steam Deck, which then you could then play it on this Xbox console, which then you could probably even then play it on your Xbox handheld. Let alone your Steam. Like, it seems to make the Steam version better because you could access the games in more places and i know you say well like if you bought the xbox version you'll be able to play the cloud gaming or whatever and you know maybe that's something that people care about uh, in the future but i don't think it's certainly anything people that many people care about today yeah but like at the same time the console industry is not growing so like it would would your argument be that Microsoft should keep doing what it's doing and keep trying to copy Sony, who, by the way, Sony's margins are non-existent. So Sony's Sony's strategy isn't working, and everyone wants Xbox to copy Sony's strategy. Is that good logic? I don't think it is. I mean... I don't know. I mean, I, I guess this is just one of those things where it's all heading... You know, people always talked about like one console to rule them all, essentially, like one console that had all the games. And like this what, will you're, be what you're describing is essentially this, of course, not Nintendo games. But still, I struggle to see how it brings in any new users and how you, Microsoft would make more money doing this because the way I see it, I think it, I think they would lose more money on this. So I think they would lose people to Steam. So. Mm, not if they do it correctly. Well, I mean, the how often in, does Xbox devil do is things in the correctly? <laughs> like, well, they've got high, higher revenue. They're, there's, sure. they're projected to report higher, our highest Xbox revenue ever this quarter. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, thank you, Activision Blizzard. No, but even without that, there would be. They've got record console users. They've got record users, even without. Activision Blizzard. 
Everyone downplays Xbox, man. Everyone's like, oh, Xbox is struggling. Game Pass is bad. Everyone really downplays Xbox. But even without Activision Blizzard, the business is done really well. You know, there's been, there's been, of course, there's been a lot of problems getting to here and fixing the Xbox in 2013. But people really downplay Xbox really underestimate xbox and everyone's so nervous like oh xbox xbox has to copy sony in order to be successful that's bullshit xbox has been successful doing what it does you know mm -hmm. i, I think um i mean i'd say it's an interesting strategy you know we'll see how it plays out we'll see how everything's implemented uh and you know We'll see if this is actually a thing that happens as well, because it's like we're so far away. I guess the question about even with the Sarah Bond thing, uh, why do you a preservation team? What exactly does that even really mean? Because Xbox is moving away from physical discs, dicks, physical dicks, physical, physical discs, physical and dicks. usually when people talk about preservation, it's like physical versions of games, because those don't go away. So, uh, like a preservation team. Unless it means they're are they bringing back the back compat team and reopening it up to get more backwards compatible games from the OG Xbox and the 360, uh, like what what really is a preservation team when the majority of the stuff you're doing is going to be digital? I mean that is kind of you know a, a good question you know and it's something that I've I've asked sources I've been like well you know game preservation. Um, has to include discs because, you know, discs are preservation, you know. I kind of feel like, even though I don't use discs, I want to advocate for people who do use discs. Mm -hmm. And they've they've had this business and they've had a disc drive in their console since forever. And I think, like, it's, it's a disservice to people who buy discs. I think I saw recently, I think it was Sakana, Matt Piscatella said 20% now of games are discs no 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 he said he said 20 percent of revenue or he something? said in 2019 uh physical uh physical stuff accounted for less than i think 10 percent of the market or something and last year 2023 physical stuff accounted for less than five percent of the market i think that was what it was I, but it, either way it was it's like down to less than five percent now yeah so it's a small amount of revenue, but it's still millions of people, I think. It's still millions of people. And I think you have to serve those people. And I think it's quite trivial to serve those people. Mm. Um, it's easy to make a USB-based Blu-ray drive and plug it in, even if that's the way they want to do it, you know, or have some kind of attachment and stuff like that. I think the next Xbox platform could really vindicate some of Microsoft's decisions because, like, imagine if... The next, imagine if the Xbox handheld, A, let's developers use the Xbox Series S SKU of their games on it. Okay. That would vindicate the Xbox Series S. And B, imagine if it lets you use the memory cards that we have now. Imagine if you could just take your memory card from your Xbox and plug it into the, straight into the handheld, and then all of your games come with you. That would also vindicate that decision too. But I think, like, you also have to acknowledge that lots of people are still using discs and i think if you are really serious about game preservation and you are looking and and just imagining that um things like the cf express sd card um not sd the cf express ssds cards that we have in the xbox console and the the uh the xbox series s SKU, if those were forward facing ideas for this potential handheld that they've been they've been thinking about this for a long time clearly from the ftc leaks surely then you must be thinking about what are we going to do with all those disc based users i think i think yeah i i think you really need to have to um i think you really need to have to um bring those ahead and i'll, I'll advocate for that personally in fact, I might write an article about it next week for my disc bros. Well, yeah, you even wrote an, an opinion article about like uh, them saying, "Hell, the the next Xbox is the biggest technological leap," and people, you know, are saying, "Well, look at the words used. Maybe it won't be that powerful or whatever, right?" And you wrote an opinion piece about it. 
uh, what was it, a couple days ago, yesterday? Sorry, can you repeat that? The article, the opinion piece you wrote a couple days ago about the largest, biggest technological leap the next Xbox is going to have. You, you, you wrote an, uh, an opinion piece about what that actually yeah, means yeah, or yeah, what you yeah, thought yeah, it yeah. might mean. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about this stuff, like, you know, the Steam store and all that kind of stuff. I didn't mention discs in that article, but I probably should have done. In fact, maybe I did. I don't know. Hey, um, I went to look at Matt Piscatello's timeline because I wanted to get that percentage right, and it is 5%. But he also tweeted, according to Sakana's player engagement tracker, Fallout 76 is currently seeing its high, highest engagement rate on the series consoles since October of 2022. Who is? Uh, Fallout 76. Nice. Um... So more people are checking out the game because obviously of the TV show. So there is that. Uh, Hazador also sent me a tweet from, it looks like a reply uh, regarding the Final Fantasy VII remake stuff. Somebody said to Z Huge, how is it underperforming Z Huge? Care to explain or share any sources that suggest that beyond what came today that it's peak of 2.23 million active players played it? And Z Huge says it's selling about half of what Remake sold in the same time frame. And it looks like it'll also have a weaker tail prior to any PlayStation Plus like release. Jesus. So he's Z Huge is saying it's selling half of what Remake sold in the same time frame. So, like I said, Remake did 3.5 million in three days. Uh, I mean, we don't. Uh, I think Remake eventually got to 7 million. I don't know. I forget how long it took took to get to seven million, but I mean, even if you take three point five million in you know three days and cut that in half, what's that? One point seven five in three days. I mean, that's that's a pretty big drop off. It's also a pretty big drop off compared to sixteen as well. Is that just the nature of like, well, I didn't enjoy remake or I didn't play remake, so I'm not going to play the sequel kind of thing. Maybe that's. Well, then I wonder what they're gonna. If that's the case, then. What are they? Uh, they're going to have to be worried about the, the, the third game. If the drop off is that severe from the first game to the second game, what's the drop off going to be like between the second game and the third game? I think they really have to rethink the third game and just be like, "Look, we need to." Hey, ship but if it Sony bought it bought simultaneously it exclusive, on PC, if Sony bought exclusivity, though, what are you going to do? Unless they had like scenarios in there where they could break the contract. You know? Yeah, maybe. It has to launch on PC. These games have to launch simultaneously on PC. They have to. I'm not even advocating for Xbox here. Of course, it would be best if they did launch on Xbox, PC, and PlayStation at the same time. But like, just take take in the fact that I play my games on Xbox out of the equation. Um, at least it has to launch on Steam. They they can't capitalize on any buzz. They can't capitalize on any marketing. You know, you you spend tons of money on marketing, and then like people look and it's like, oh, I can't play it on the platform I play on. Mm -hmm. Um, we do got some super chats here. I want to get to. Uh, we got yeah, James. Let's do super chats and then hit Patreon because it's getting late. Okay, we got James saying, uh, for the weekend fund. 2024 is definitely not empty as expected. I'm having a fantastic gaming year. That's awesome, James. Uh, D3KY with the five. Rebs put out a video a bit ago about Project Infinity for Halo 5. was supposed to be a hub multiplayer on the UNC Infinity. Sorry, I'm behind on live. I, we did kind of talk about his points in his video. Neither of us watched it. I just kind of read off his Twitter. Uh, J Train with the 499. Do you think Halo would be better off with the hard reboot instead of a continuing from Infinite? Well, that is the discussion, is it not? Do you continue on from Infinite, continue the storyline, or do you basically do a refresh? I don't know. They have some big decisions to make for the future of the franchise. Uh, Dead Planet with the five says, In my opinion, the Series X will be the console that was supposed to be the Xbox's revival, but took too way, long, too, way too long to release anything. How will you guys remember it? Hmm. How will you remember this? That's a good question. How will you remember the Series X? Probably the COVID box. The COVID honest. box? Yeah, I mean, COVID really derailed this gen, I think. Really, really derailed it. 
um, everything about it. You know, it kind of like it's it's weird because the, you'd think COVID would have helped convert people to gaming, but it really doesn't seem to have done. It seems to have like you know, once the lockdowns lifted, it kind of made it feels like people are like, okay, I'm not going to game now. I'm going to go outside because I haven't been able to go outside. And it feels like a lot of people have put gaming down. Like gaming hours have gone down since the pandemic. And I think habits did change. I think people got addicted to scrolling on TikTok and stuff like that during the pandemic. Um, and it ruined a bunch of games launches. We're seeing layoffs as a result of um, overinvestment and stuff like that now. So yeah, I, kind of COVID for me defines these consoles. And it's a shame. It's a shame. It derailed the industry. I don't know. I don't know I'm yeah. going to remember these consoles. Well, I'll have to wait and see until it's all said and done. Usually I remember the consoles as like the games you played on them and which one stood out the most. Um, But yeah, we'll have to wait and see how it's all said and done. I mean, I like the fact that the series consoles mostly play everything at 60 frames uh, outside of a handful of games that are at 30. Uh, so to me, it's more about like bringing on you know, better frame rates and stuff. But as far as game wise, like what's the ones like Elden Ring is probably a standout, but even still that was cross gen. But I, I don't know. We'll have to, I'll have to revisit that eventually towards when we get closer to the release of the next consoles. Uh, Keyshawn Thompson member for 28 months says, hello, what's going on, buddy? Uh, Jay Rembart with the 10 Rand, you're not stupid. Look at it this way. If somehow Microsoft can make it convenient for you to play all of your games on one box, it's going to sell like hotcakes because of convenience. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I guess if they can convince PC people to do it, but I just don't really see like hardcore PC guys wanting to spend money on a box. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're PC dudes. They're not going to. Like they're they want they're like consoles not for us anymore, so I don't Really? Well, that kind that kind of kills your argument that it's going to replace Xbox, then, doesn't no, it? No, my thing, no, because my thing that Phil always talks about in these interviews lately is about finding new players, and I struggle to. I'm just wondering how does a box with Steam bring new players to Xbox? That's the question I have. I think the the real kicker there is like. Just trying something new. Well, even okay, you can yeah, you could say that. And he talks about like the oh, let's find new players and handheld. Like the handheld, I, I think. I is think a, that I think they don't know how to find new players. That's why they're trying everything now. Sure, and that that could definitely be a thing. Even with the handheld that we've talked about, I think the handheld is a great device for people already in the e Xbox uh, ecosystem that want to be able to take their games uh, anywhere. Like, hey, I'm I'm on a train, or I'm on a plane, I'm going here. Like the handheld is a way to go, or you know, my kids or my, my wife take control of the TV and I can't play anything. So boom, late at night, I get on my, my handheld and I'm playing. I just don't really think that's going to be something, a, a device that really brings in new users. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe it, maybe it can, maybe it will. Maybe people look at it like, oh, well, this Switch gamer who's young is about to graduate up to xbox or his next console and that would be something he's familiar with because that's how playstation always viewed nintendo was playstation always said nintendo is like introduces kids to gaming but eventually those kids grow up and they want a more uh, adult experience because nintendo's more of a well, at least they're more it's more of a kiddie experience i guess sorry don otaku my bad for saying nintendo's more of a kiddie experience but you get the point i'm trying to make and like playstation always said that nintendo basically brings these kids into gaming and then when the kids graduate to wanting more mature content that playstation's right there to pick them up with the type of experiences they want the problem is you know, Gen Z apparently isn't really interested that much in consoles. Uh, or maybe not interested in certain consoles. Maybe they don't care about Xbox. Maybe they still care about Nintendo. I don't know. There's a lot of questions. And, and maybe Xbox... Do you think... What do you... What do you, you know, when Sarah said at the podcast about uh, hardware, exciting hardware being revealed this fall, what do you think she's talking about? Is she? Are they going to reveal the handheld? Are they going to reveal their plans for next gen? Are they going to reveal the uh, the cloud device? What, no idea. What do you What do you think it would be if you had to take a guess? 
I want to see the controller, to be honest. Um, but yeah, the controller. I don't know if it's too early to reveal some of this stuff. Well, I mean, they said it, so. Yeah. Uh, DS Omen with the five says, if the next gen Xbox is significantly cheaper than a PC build and runs Steam games, then there's a few reasons to buy a PC. Then there's a few reasons to buy a PC over an Xbox. It flips the narrative. Sure. I guess it depends on a lot of factors, but. Anyways, uh, let's move on over to Patreon questions. Uh, if you guys do us a big favor, make sure you hit the like button, please. Subscribe if you're new. If you want to join the Patreon, simple links in the description. Patreon.com slash XP2. A lot of different tiers, a lot of different things you can get. And um, yeah, we appreciate anybody that uh, has been with us for the journey. But let me bring this up. Let me get these questions ready, Jez. I know because yeah. it's getting late for you because we started an hour later. Th- for you, this time it wasn't my fault. It was your fault. Yeah, it's my fault. But uh, really okay, we got we got the questions up for episode 311. We have Silas. Says, hey, Jesse and Rand, with all the recent discourse about the younger generations growing up with mobile and free-to-play games, I decided to do a bit of hands-on research and delve into the mobile world for the first time in over a decade. After playing a bit of COD Warzone, Diablo, Genshin, Star Rail, and a few others, I was shocked. Console-level graphics. These are full, fat gaming experiences and can be easily played without spending a dime, if you don't mind the grind. I asked my nephew, age 14, about these games, and he didn't call them free-to-play. He called them choose-to-pay. It kind of clarified Xbox's desire to get into mobile. My question is... How the heck can Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo convince these emerging consumers to spend $500 on a plastic box and then $70 on a single game plus microtransactions in many cases when you can get a AAA experience for free and have cost control on how much you spend on them? That is the question, isn't it? Yeah, this is the dilemma that the traditional platform holders have, you know, is that people our age having kids working too much too busy and you know and dying of old age you know um in in, in eventually so you have to kind of you have to start thinking about the younger generations and how you can get them into into your business and the answer is hard you know you can't convert someone who's spending a lot of their time via the convenience of an everything device they've got in their pocket um and try and get them to to switch to a tv based device and tv experience it's very very difficult and um i think that's why they're they're throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks right now one of those things is a handheld one of those things is opening up the box to third party stores one of those things is you know experimenting with putting some games on other platforms and another one of those things is mobile you know microsoft is launching a bunch of mobile games this year um age of empires online or or age of empires mobile sorry and you've got uh, elder scrolls castles which is basically fallout shelter in the elder scrolls universe fallout shelter 2 as well is available in china exclusively right now for some reason but hasn't been released in the west that could be released in the west any day now so like the idea for Microsoft is to be everything everywhere all at once, try to cater to everyone as much as they possibly can. And, you know, the, I wrote an article where I was worried that the lack of focus would harm the different experiences. But, like, if they pull it off and they don't neglect any specific vertical, then it could only be a good thing. You know, and a bunch of people in chat were asking, like, what about Xbox achievements? Like we haven't had an updates to those. And these are the kind of things I'm talking about. Like if you, it's great that you want to do all this extra stuff and you want to chase Gen Z and all those younger gamers, but you've still got to do stuff for us, you know, and the, the people who've made the business what it is today. But when it comes to, you know, how do you, how do you get these people who, who've grown up expecting a certain kind of experience? Like I, I, I told the story of what, like my, my younger Gen Z cousin, being shocked that minecraft wasn't free you know um that's exactly it that's exactly the 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 issue they've got you know and you know around i've said it before the answer is waifus and husbandos man 
Yeah, I mean, this is also... Anime games. Anime games. This is... I mean, a lot of people um, that I've talked to, uh, they talk about these free-to-play games and these experiences you can get that are, like you said, is Silas calls them fat gaming experiences, right? As one of the reasons why AAA games or like indie games or what like have a lot of problems getting a lot of traction because why should I spend seventy dollars in Dragon's Dogma when I can just go play Fortnite for free? Yeah. Or Final Fantasy Seven Rebirth, incidentally. Yeah. I mean or- Final, Fan- Final Fantasy Seven Rebirth competes with Genshin Impact directly on that console. Or why yeah. do I need to spend fifteen dollars a month on Game Pass? When I can play, you know, any one of these free to play games as much as I want without spending any money or spending money within that game that I'm playing and not maybe potentially spending it on, on Game Pass and not getting something I want to play. Right. These are the questions the companies ask because it's, it's, yeah, the black, these black hole games that just take up all this time and suck up all this money. You have people not willing to spend money on new experiences because they don't need to or want to. And these young kids are in this mindset growing up that this is how gaming should be. So then how do you convince them that no, gaming is actually buying this for 70 bucks? It's a tough sell, especially for gamers. Like the thing is we grew up and if you wanted to gaming play games, you had to get a console. And the consoles and the games cost this much, so you can sort of said we've been indoc- indoctrinated into it, right? But these kids mm. have grown up, and the games are everywhere, and the games are super cheap, and they can play the games wherever they want, whether it's on their iPhones, or their Androids, or their tablets, or their PCs, or their TVs. It's not Samsung like some smart fridge. Yeah, it's not like it's not like how we grew up, where it was like if I wanted to play a game, I had to buy this device. Like, they have the devices and the games are just there. And they don't really have to even spend any money on it. And now it's like, oh, well, you know, real gaming is spending $500 on this PlayStation 5 or Xbox and then spending even more money on these things. And when people are like, what? Some kids might be like, that's ridiculous. Mm, so it's definitely yep. a problem. And I don't necessarily know how you solve that problem. So... That's just something they're just going to have to deal with. Maybe you can, you can tie and they try to do this, but I don't think they're doing it very well. Tying the free, like giving free to uh, games that are free to play perks within game pass. So you subscribe to game pass to get these perks. Um, it'd be interesting to see what they do with call of duty Warzone when, you know, this year or the new call of duty, what sort of perks are you going to have with game pass ultimate? Like there should be, perks right now for Diablo 4 like the, the, the one other thing that was mentioned in your email about how like is Diablo uh, Xbox is now the biggest platform for Diablo right because of its inclusion in the game pass um, Jazz right yeah like I don't That's know true. I don't know if it hasn't happened yet but where's the Diablo 4 perks in game pass ultimate yeah uh, is that a thing yet, Jez? And if it isn't a thing, it probably should be a thing. It should be a thing. So there's things that you could try to do, but sometimes they don't They do not do it. Like, you should be cutting deals with Epic to get some sort of perks for Fortnite. Maybe they do, and I just don't pay attention to it because I don't care about Fortnite. But I mean, they do have some kind of deal with Fortnite because Fortnite is exclusively available on the Xbox Cloud Gaming. True. But, but yeah, all the extra perks and stuff. It's... They need to be, because we kind of move into this world where, of different niches, I think. Mm. And like, even though there are these black hole games, you just kind of have to accept that they exist. You know, it's not like, it's not like you could make a direct competitor to Fortnite and take some of Fortnite's market share any more than like any of the Minecraft or World of Warcraft clones that have come along over the years have managed to dent those games either, you know. Um, so you have to kind of work around that. And I think one of the ways to work around that is to try and make games that appeal to every kind of niche that you can. I think that's why Game Pass has such a diverse array of content in it, but it's a big wide discussion that 
people could have yeah. a lot of different takes on. Did you see Spyro um, got listed for Windows PC? The Windows Store? I did, yes. I did, yeah. I don't know That's... if that implies a Game Pass edition soon, but yeah, it does. It, it kind of is like, oh, so with Diablo, they made you link your Battle.net account. But with Spyro, they actually went and made a Windows Store PC version. They did. Interesting, is it not? No, no, I don't know. Is is there a Spyro PC version on Battle.net? Or did like was there no PC version of Spyro that existed outside of like the Steam version? And this was like the only know. way to get a PC version of Spyro. I think Steam was the only way to get it. Yeah, there's not there's it's not on Battle.net. Battle.net is only Blizzard games and COD. So they probably like all right, well, I guess you could say we don't we we don't have to put this game on PC for the Windows Store, but they obviously did because they want to be like, oh, that Game Pass and PC Game Pass. But yeah, it's probably coming to Game Pass soon. So um, NetEase just put out some information, by the way, speaking okay. of catering to every niche. Um, two million players have already registered for World of Warcraft in two days. Oh, I feel sad for In them. China. In China. Sad. sad for them. That's mega, mega based. Mega based. Mm. And they are, they are recovering. They are recovering people's accounts Mm -hmm. and also they want to they're rebuilding the gore house statue that netties destroyed when blizzard and netties broke up (laughs) okay oh my oh my god they've posted a thousand oh no no i read that wrong they've received a thousand resumes for new roles in the blizzard netties company well, guess so, what? They're all be taken up by AI, so we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's cash money, bro. It's it is cash, cash money. money. Uh, Dave Ramos, my question is about licensing in a future where Xbox OS is accessible on PCs or a hybrid dual boot handheld. Back and Pat was great, and that program came to an end, not due to technical issues, but licensing hurdles. How would licensing get handheld? That would allow me to access all my native Xbox games via an Xbox OS. Would this hybrid dream come to a similar ending where only some of my native Xbox games would be accessible? Jez? Well, theoretically, the Xbox handheld would run an Xbox operating system, in which mm-hmm. case there wouldn't need to be there wouldn't need to be a licensing funnel. It would just be the same license. That's where like this sort of talk about like a more Windows based xbox operating system where that starts to become a little bit more do they can they do this and still call it an xbox from what i've heard they can but we'll have to wait and see to confirm it um what i want to know is like if they do do this does this mean i'll be able to eventually get you know run that xbox operating system in some kind of container on my pc yeah you know the dream, the dream would be to get my Xbox games actually on my PC. You know, maybe that's when the li- I think that's when the licensing gets really confusing. But I think the handheld, yeah, I think you, you, I think you covered with the handheld. That'd be everything. And I've also heard that they're still on track to get all of your games on Xbox Cloud Gaming this year. So, and I think with with that Cloud Gaming, it was it was an issue because that is a different sort of delivery vehicle. But a handheld is basically just an Xbox with a screen already attached to it. There's not, there's not really, it's not really a different platform there. All right, for anybody that wants to be able to play their own games on XCloud, might be coming sometime this year. Maybe announced at uh, the June showcase potentially. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, a lot of things Maybe. announced at the June showcase that Jess says he, he's hearing some hype things about. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Logan Meyer yeah. says, "Hey y'all, hope you all is well." With Sarah Bond and Xbox doubling down on commitment to back and pat and future proofing libraries, any chance they also look at building some remaster remake studios to handle some dormant IPs like a Night Dive or a Blue Point type studio? That I think that would be a good idea. Probably, I, I would agree. S- well, it, I, I would say no, though. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, you can say no, but you're wrong. Oh, so you think they're actually going to be building some remaster remake studios whose only purpose is to remake older IPs? I don't think so. I don't think that's happening. Oh, I don't... Th- uh, no, okay. That's I what he says. I don't, do you think any chance... I don't chance... think they will do it. 
but I think they should. Do Any it. chance they also look at building some remaster remake studios? I would say, like I said, the chance for that I think is low. Yeah, I agree. The chance for that is low, but I think they should do it because there's a huge amount of you know potential content they could port there. But maybe they'll use AI to do some of that stuff. Oh god, you know AI. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, you know, AI upscale, not not to develop the game, but I'm talking like graphics upscaling, FPS boost, frame generation, that kind of thing. Because the way they do FPS boost right now is like they literally speed up the game to twice its normal speed mm -hmm. and then slow down the gameplay. So like you get the extra frames, but you can't do that for every game because of the way they're designed but like with with ai you could do you could do like frame generation potentially to get 60 frames out of those 30 frames per second games um so maybe they'll hand off some of it to that aspect of it but for those much older games i would love to see a fallout one remake a big budget fallout one and fallout two remake i would love to see that um but like vicarious visions like were kind of squandered you know um they made uh diablo resurrected uh, which was amazing really really great and then blizzard kind of absorbed them into the general diablo team i think um they were working on lots of those kind of remake contents and blizzard's had mixed success of remakes like the warcraft 3 remake was terrible for example but the diablo 2 remake was really good um but yeah, there's a lot of potential there. We'll see what happens. Okay. We have achievement. If the multi-platform goal was to get cash flow for the studios, why didn't Xbox allow Obsidian to do a Fallout New Vegas remaster? It would have probably taken the same amount of effort to port Grounded to Switch and sell 100 times more than Grounded or Pentiment on PlayStation and Nintendo. Seems like a huge missed opportunity. Bethesda should, shouldn't have a say on New Vegas at this point. It's Xbox leadership's job to grow these franchises now, not Todd and the old guard. I mean, I, I kind of agree there, and I I was actually wrong when I said the multi-platform goal was about cash flow for those studios. That was kind of like speculation on my part, but someone told me that's that's incorrect since then. Um it is just a case of like find needing to find growth and staying ahead of potential cash flow issues down the line. And I think like with regards to grounded and pentiment, it was definitely experiment to see what kind of games do work on Sony's platform and what potentially don't work on Sony's platform. And I think they're going to find that games like pentiment hi-fi don't work on Sony's platform or maybe indeed any platform. But, um, that's, uh, maybe those games do need a game pass vehicle to get, users or something but i do agree that all that new vegas remaster would be absolutely awesome mm -hmm. um maybe even do a remake or a port or a sequel or something it's just it's just increasingly painful that there's no fallout 5 even in development as far as we know beyond todd's ideas and notes you know but yeah I agree. It's, it's it can't all fall on Todd. It can't. Yeah, but they'll probably have it fall on them. I don't know about the idea that a Fallout New Vegas remaster would sell a hundred times more than Grounded, though. Because Grounded, Ground. I don't know. I think Ground is gonna have a sequel. I think Ground Ground is also got well the TV show, but so does Fallout. Um. It, I don't know. I, I I just don't really see a Fallout New Vegas remastered selling that well, to be honest. If maybe if it was a remake and not just like a remaster, a low effort remaster. Yeah, the game's really old. It'd it is really old. It, it would have to be a complete remake from the ground up. I agree. So and that and that is like, okay, maybe that would probably do well. But we, as we know, Todd is very touchy about other teams working on, you know, Bethesda games, and we don't even know if the Fallout Three remaster is a real thing. So, I don't know. I kind of disagree with you about a Fallout New Vegas remaster selling a hundred times more than Grounded or doing better. Uh, but I guess we'll never know, anyways. Mm. 
Uh, Sean Kramer says, you two are sadistic vault tech executives sitting in a boardroom meeting scheming of new vault experiment ideas. What could you two sickos come up with? You know, that's that's interesting. I was <laughs> actually like explaining vault tech the vaults to my girlfriend the other day and I I didn't I looked up a list of the different experiments there were and there was a ton I didn't even know about. Some of them are absolutely awful. Yeah. And I think some some of them like some of them will probably get Bethesda cancelled if more people knew about them. Like, like um what are they? What are they? There's one of the vaults where there's nine hundred and ninety nine men and one woman. Uh oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but what, what what's the experiment? What the 999 men would do? Uh, yeah, I I don't know what the experiment is. I, I, it's just I like, hey, this is this is the setup. Cool. I, but like, what's the experiment? Uh, I don't know. I I can't remember. I just re I just read the the premise of the vault. But um, my my vault would be um. Uh, there'd be one member, <laughs> and it would be Rand. Okay. And the it would have everything he needed except the only entertainment he would have access to is the full suite of Pokemon games. He would have no TV or books and it'd be an experiment to see how long it takes for him to go mad. That's my vault. Mm -hmm. And that's vault 69. Nice. I would, um, <laughs> I'd have a vault. <laughs> where the only sustenance you could get is beans. Oh, that's a great vault. Take me there. And we'll Take see how there, long baby. That, that vault <laughs> lasts for. Beans are really nutritious, you know? Or great. I'd have a vault of vitamins, protein, where the people calories. who complete the games are the leaders of the community and the ones who don't complete their games get thrown out and killed <laughs> wow <laughs> that's mean yeah. maybe some people in chat can give us some vault ideas uh we got a one here from omen this week no clip released a documentary on pentiment everyone should give it a watch related to obsidian what do you think josh sawyer has been working on since he released pentiment fallout return to vegas avowed two baldur's gate four Half joking on the last one, but Larian did say they wouldn't be making it. So yeah, what is Josh Sawyer up to? I wouldn't be surprised Man, if he's working on Avada. the current project. Yeah, he's on Avowed and Outworlds too, probably in some capacity. I would imagine. Um, I mean, you only had a team of like thirteen people for Pentiment. I would imagine yeah. those people might have been moved to a project that needed them, and then I don't know. I don't necessarily think Josh started a brand new game like right after finishing Pentiment, do you? I want the $500 million Pillars of Eternity that he talked about. Yeah, well, you're not getting that. <sighs> no, probably not. But what if what if he was working on Fallout Return to Vegas? Would you want that? Yeah, man. Anything with Fallout, give it to me. Okay. It's Even if it was Fallout Tactics 2, man. Uh, can you imagine if there was a Fallout 5 game like right around the corner off of this TV show? Oh, yeah, it'd be, it would be it would be the perfect, and it was Xbox exclusive. It'd be the perfect bump that Xbox needed. But unfortunately, we won't get a Fallout. Um, we won't get a new Fallout for another eleven years. Rip, 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 rip. Uh, good old Collinwood. Hello, random jazz. So early in the year, you had a rash of YouTube content creators such as Tom Scott, Matt Pat, Joel Haver, and Meat Canyon that either have left the platform, reduced their content, or changed the direction of their work. This was due to, among other things, their relentless grind of creating content, diminishing returns caused by YouTube's changing monetary mechanisms, or just plain old burnout. I noticed that in a lot of Xbox content creator circles, quite a lot of people are regularly watched. I haven't seen videos from them in a quite a while, or have reduced the number of videos they make. Rand, you, have you decided on a direction you want to take the channel, and if so, when will we know more? Do you see yourself following these big YouTubers in a hiatus, or should we expect something new from you? That's a good question. I mean, I want to know the answer to this as well. I mean, I don't really even know the answer to this, but yeah, I mean, I give it a lot of thought. Um, I love doing the podcast with Jez, so that's why we do the podcast. I just really haven't, my heart's not really into making video content. Um, not saying that 
I won't ever want to do that. Or maybe the type of video content I used to make, I don't want to make anymore. In my in my head, in my head, when we start doing the podcast on camera, that might get me back into making video content on camera instead of the way I used to. Because the way I used to still took a while. It's to, even though I wasn't there, I still edited that, and it still took like two hours to three hours to make. So part of me is just like, maybe it's time to go on camera and make that sort of transition um, to being an on-camera personality. But yeah, I mean, I think about it all the time. And I will say I got burnt out from the grind. The grind can wear you out when you're constantly looking for stories and talking about them and then reading the comments and then seeing people attack you in the comments and then doing that day after day after day after day, it can, yeah, it can be exhausting uh, and it could and, and not feel rewarding. And I definitely ran up, ran up to it where I was just straight up burned out uh, on it all. So, you know, um, that's kind of where I'm at now. I mean, I kind of went through this in my teens. <laughs> Cause I used to be I used to be a stick death cartoon animator. Yeah. Kinda like And you got Lee sick Canyon. of animating sticks? It was it, uh, making flash cartoons is hard can work, man. And like I see dudes like Meat Canyon who do like full body frame by frame animation. And I'm just in awe at how they're able to do that so quickly. Like when I was a kid, I mean, to be fair, I used to animate using a trackball mouse, not a drawing tablet. So that probably added a good amount of hours to my workflow. But it took me like months to put together like second, um, oh, not second, like a few minutes of animation, you know. And eventually in my, in my, in my teens, I started, I was, I had a website cause this was before social media. I had a website where like you could play my, the games that I'd made and yeah, it was, it was my new ground zero, you know, uh, clicks, clicks <laughs> chat. It was my new ground zero. I had like, um, a bunch of games on my website. I used to upload them to new grounds and there'd be a link on the, the video that you could click on or the flash cartoon and it'd bring people to my website. And I start. I was actually blogging on there, and I was realizing, like, man, more and more people are coming to read my blog posts. Cause I used to blog about TV shows back then, um, and just rant and do these little doodles. And I was like, this is so much easier than animating cartoons. <laughs> so like, I just started writing instead. But then, but then I, you know, I grew up, had to get a real job and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I do miss animating. It's just so much work, man. Yeah. I mean, so I've even work. thought about, like, moving the channel into more, like, like talk about gaming, talk about Xbox, do the podcast, but then, like, talk about books and talk about do reactions or whatever. I don't know. But for those sort of things, I'd probably have to actually start new channels as they would conflict with one another or whatever. But, yeah, no, I'm always thinking about stuff, so... We got uh, A Fury J West. So, since video games are moving towards a digital future, do you think the price for a digital game should be lower than buying a physical version? Yeah, I've Ooh. sort of always felt that way. I've always felt the digital game should be cheaper than a physical game. That always confused me as a kid when that started happening. I was like, shouldn't the digital version be cheaper? And it often was on Steam, but that trend seems to have ended now i mean i know steam has a lot of sales that make up for it but there was a time where it was like the standard that steam version would be ten dollars cheaper than the physical disc version on xbox or playstation but that seems to have ended now i um the re i don't i'm not sure what the exact reasoning behind that is because they can get away with it, maybe because because they can get away with it, maybe yeah, yeah, maybe because the retailers wouldn't don't want to sell a, a, a copy of a game that's cheaper 
on the other stores because they feel like nobody would buy those. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. and I suppose like with retailers, there's also the the issue of storage space. Like they have to sell it because otherwise it's taking up storage space and potentially costing them money. I don't know. I'd have to ask someone who, who understands that stuff a bit more, but yeah. It's ultimately ultimately consumer spending controls the prices. So if people will pay for it, then that's it. Yeah. A Governor Grimm says, guys, considering Xbox is all about every screen is an Xbox, when do you think that will ever actually be the case? As in, when will I be able to turn on my PC or streaming device and have the same library I have on my console? The ecosystem currently feels like an amalgamation of three incomplete puzzles thrown in a single puzzle box. It's all related, but they aren't cohesive. I like that. I think, yeah, that's a great that's a great analogy, and it's completely true. Like the other day, I went on because I was I was setting up my Lenovo Legion Go because I know I'm going to be traveling soon, and I want to have I want to have some games downloaded for it. So like I specific, specifically went to the Xbox app, and I, I I filtered by Xbox Play Anywhere so I could get those save files running across my Xbox and on the Lenovo. But there's really not that many games. It's like maybe 30, 40, 50 games at most that have Xbox Play Anywhere attached to it. And they're all games that have come through Game Pass and have been, like, you know, um, uh, fostered to do that. But I do think, like, this is this has to be central to Microsoft's idea of this ecosystem because if, like, if they are be doing something disruptive like they're doing where it's, like, you know, bring your own store bring your own games to our platform, you know, bring your Steam library to your Xbox and all that kind of stuff. They kind of have to make sure that they are offering at least a comparable experience to that of Steam. You know, if I can't get my Xbox games on my PC, I mean, you know, Rand, Rand talks about like how like, um, you know, people will buy people will buy games on Steam more because Steam has more games. I think the bigger issue potentially, and maybe Rand agrees with me on this, I think the bigger issue potentially is like the fact that if I buy a game on Steam on Xbox, then I know it'll be available on PC with the Steam cloud well, that, save. That was that was Whereas, my whole point, because it seems that whole thing makes Steam even a better value because if you buy the game on Steam, you could play it on your PC, you could play it on this mythical Xbox device you could play it on a steam deck you could play it on the mythical xbox handheld right it seems like you'd be able to play that in more places than you would you know the xbox game right i agree i agree that if they are doing this with the storefronts then i have to be able to get my xbox games on my pc as well otherwise steam is obviously the best choice because steam will give you the games on xbox they will give you the games on pc and you can have them on a handheld on the steam deck as well you know whether it's or whether it's an Asus ROG or the Steam Deck, the Steam Deck, Steam Deck. You know, when Microsoft kind of pushes themselves again, pushes themselves again against the wall. Then Xbox will have the cloud stuff, but I think cloud only works in certain markets. I don't think cloud's necessarily going to work in their core markets like the US and UK, because you know the the consoles are affordable enough here. I think like the the Cloud works in markets where the consoles are tariffed to hell, like Brazil, mm-hmm. to some degree. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see. These are questions that Microsoft has to answer to get everyone on board. Like, I'm taking a more optimistic position, but I agree. I agree with everyone. If Microsoft doesn't deliver on these possibilities when they are flirting with this putting Steam on Xbox, then it could be it could be a disaster, you know. It has to be it has to be done right. It has to be done right. If they're doing this, it has to be done right. We have Last Horizon that says, Hey guys, what's the process of getting sources for insider information and leaks? Do you have to try and build that relationship by reacting, reaching out to people, or do they come to you first? Jazz, that that's one for you. That's one for you, man. And one for me. I'm not an insider. Randall insider. I honestly don't know. I think like it just kind of it happens naturally as a result of being in the gaming industry, covering games and being obsessive with it. You end up meeting people and then meeting people through those people and then making friends with those people. And then it just all sort of starts happening as a natural 
occurrence of being close to the industry. It's not something, I mean, I don't know how other people do it, but it's not something I go out every day and try to do or try to access. It's also not really my job. Um, I mean, I will report information if I do get it, but I'm also not going to, I'm not going to dig into someone for information because I think that, that stuff should be offered up voluntarily. Um, you know, and if they do want to share stuff, sometimes people st put stuff out there because they want, they want it to be out there because they think maybe a project of theirs is under threat or they, you know, there's some, some, you know, in the case of like Bloomberg or something, there's like injustice potentially taking place at their workplace and they want people to know about it, that kind of stuff. So I suppose it is generally a case of people reaching out. Um, but I never, I never personally dig for information. I just, I just work in the industry and just end up networking and meeting people and making friends with people. And it just happens naturally. Yeah, normally you meet, you make friends with people and then sometimes they share something with you. And then if you don't go and tell everybody about it, they might trust you and it goes from there. Sometimes they do come to you first. Uh, James says, did. hi, what's up, lovely people? If you could pick one indie title to get the beloved AAA treatment, which would it be? Huh. Hmm. Indie game getting a AAA treatment. Pillars of Eternity. Okay. Because at the time it was, at the time it was an indie game. I don't know. The first one that came to my head is Hades. Hmm. I don't know. What would that even look like? I don't, don't know. Maybe that's why it came to my head. It was like, I wonder what Hades would look like. Hmm. It's interesting. Just James 93. Let's go back in time. It's 2019. COVID has just hit. Uh, but the Chinese government somehow discovered a cure and it never became a pandemic. Fast forward to 2024 in an alternate reality. Do you think Xbox or Microsoft would be different? If the pandemic didn't happen. If so, how? Do you think... We lost out. That's interesting because we kind of touched on that. I think um, it would be because I think the games would have all shifted forward. So I think the year I've, I sort of blamed 2022 as I think I've, I've always said that I think people were willing to give Microsoft a second chance because they're like buying new studios, getting the games ready and they had a good 2021. And if you look at like the sales at the time, they were kind of, neck and neck with PlayStation, although PlayStation was supply constrained and so was Xbox. It was really 2022 which changed everything because Xbox didn't have anything. And I sort of wonder how that would have changed if they had Series X in stock and they actually had the games they promised would be available because I sort of look at it like the games that are out now would all have been like shifted a year if there wasn't COVID. Like Hellblade would have came out last year. And Starfield would would have came out in 2022. Like we, at least, at least to me, that's kind of the way I look at it. Like a lot of the releases have been shifted a year or two. And I think if Xbox had, didn't have that year where they was just nothing and they actually had stuff, like the game shifted from 2023 to 2022 or whatever, then maybe they're in a better spot. Maybe they have sold more consoles and people didn't. Because I really do think people saw 2022, saw them get delayed and didn't have anything and just said, oh, Xbox hasn't changed. Yeah. And it kind of went from there. And I wonder if like, okay, well, if you actually had a steady stream of content and stuff wasn't delayed or pushed, how would this have affected everything? Uh, I do think it would be different because I think everything would have been shifted forward. We wouldn't have been waiting for as long for these games as we've had been waiting. But yeah, I mean, this year's E3 would maybe have been last year's, or maybe not, because there's going to be a bunch of ABK stuff there. But, but at least for first party, then yeah. Uh, Luke Spook says hi, gents. Hope you're well. I watched Godzilla X Kong last week. Very silly and loads of fun. It got me thinking of the old game Rampage. I used to play Rampage all the time in the arcades, Jazz. Did you? No. I no, you never played the Rampage, the Lizard? I don't think so. So what games nah, are the highlights for you in the genre playing the monster? 
The Darkness, Ooh, Legacy of Kane, Dead Cells are probably mine picks. Yeah, I mean, The Darkness is a good one. This, this is an easy one for me. Okay. Carrion. Carrion's Carrion, a good one, too. Yeah. Yeah. I loved Carrion. Carrion was such a great game. One of my favorite games. Brilliant game. Definitely one of my favorite. Darkness games. is cool because you're, like, eating hearts with your tentacle arms. I love The Darkness 1. Mm-hmm. Didn't like Darkness 2 so much. It kind of went, it leaned more into arcade in Darkness 2. And I think it was closer to the comics in Darkness 2. I think I saw people say, but like the Darkness 1 was like, it was so good. It was so gothic. It's almost like it was very atmospheric, slower paced. I really prefer the Darkness 1. But I do have a lot of fond memories of playing Rampage. Climbing up those buildings, smashing it, knocking it down. I, I used to play that a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, tricks are for Trey. Jez, any word I'm of... I'm prototype. I'm oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, prototype's a good one. Jez, any word of Xbox Game Pass expanding to more TV manufacturers in the near future? Rand, how can the Wheel of Time end... <laughs> how can the Wheel of Time ending not frustrate you with the people not picking up that the three girls bonnet to Rand aren't going crazy? The what? Nah, you wouldn't know. Go ahead and answer that part. <laughs> um, I've I've heard for a while that LG is the next one to get it, but I don't know when. Um, um, yeah, it could be that Samsung extended exclusivity. Samsung's really going hard on marketing. Like every time I turn my TV on, it's like, do you know you can play Xbox on your TV? Um. Yeah. Um, Trix, as far as I remember, nobody knows that the three girls are bonded to Rand, and it's not the bond isn't like the bond between the A Sedai. Uh where if the one dies, if the A Sedai dies or the warder dies, they go crazy. It, they're not really bonded. It's like a different f- form of something. So one, nobody knows that they even have that bond between them and it's not it's not the bond that would make you go absolutely nuts i think there were i think because i think uh carion or whoever her name is the old the old asadi does realize just by the actions of the three like not really paying attention to the i don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't read wheel of time or seen it but essentially not reacting the way you would think they react like she knew that what happened but yeah no like it didn't frustrate me because nobody knew and the bond wasn't like the other bond sorry book yeah, discussion oh nine c mine says hey guys hope you are doing well <laughs> just want to complain about spoilers jodica says is this a world of warcraft lore dump <laughs> <laughs> i mean it was he's literally talking about the ending of the wheel of time like the last, you just, the you literally last it. like three pages of the books or whatever. You no, because you, you wouldn't even perfect. you wouldn't even know what I'm talking about if you didn't even, you know. Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Just wondered if you guys had heard if Microsoft has done anything to improve the cloud servers. Personally, here in the UK where I live, the queue times were bad, but recently in the past weeks, it's been instant, even at peak times. Well, I Jess says they've world. been investing more, haven't they, in the cloud stuff? They have been investing more, but. Power World has also dropped off, and I think Power World blew up mm. the servers quite a lot in January. So it'll probably ebb and flow, but I'll they are rolling out new servers. They are investing, so I'll try and I'll try and get some information on that. Uh, but, um, let's see. We got Subeg. Hey, gentlemen. This one is specifically for Jez. Is Dragon's Dogma 1 worth playing through now that Dragon's Dogma 2 is out? I feel like Dragon's Dogma 2 still needs a few more months to cook, and the first one is quite polished on Steam. Just a quick question. Hope you two have a beautiful Friday, and keep being great. Well, thank you. The reason people like Dragon's Dogma 1 is because it has an endgame system called the Everfall in it, which arrived with Dark Arisen. I haven't actually experienced the Everfall myself. Um... But it's kind of tough for me to say because I haven't really gotten to that point in Dragon's Dogma 1. Personally, 
after playing Dragon's Dogma 2, I kind of don't feel like going back to Dragon's Dogma 1 because even though, like, it does have a lot of cool stuff in it, it still feels overall dated to play after playing Dragon's Dogma 2. But if you're someone who likes those sort of nostalgic kind of experiences, there's, n there's nothing stopping you going back to check it out. Um, especially if you want to get into the Everfall and Min Max and your characters there and stuff. I do agree that Dragon's Dogma 2 probably needed more time to cook in retrospect. I think it kind of bugs me that a lot of the story threads aren't ever resolved in the game. It kind of bugs me that there's no real end game system and also the enemy variety is really lacking, I think, and it really becomes apparent when you get to like the last third of the game. Um, but it's also like, it's. I also feel like it's okay to have a game that actually just ends. Like, it actually felt like like when I finished Dragon's Dogma on my second playthrough and I'd done everything, I'd done every single quest and got the best possible ending, as far as I know anyway, the best possible, possible ending. It was kind of like, wow, it's nice to actually just be done with the game for once. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's worth checking out, maybe. It's definitely got a lot more variety than Dragon's Dogma 2. Yeah. Uh, because of monsters. Kraken56 says, Jez tweeted about it being showcase season. Has he heard anything about other showcases, specifically the PlayStation one? I have not heard anything about PlayStation. Yeah, you but need to not I... mention anything about PlayStation and their showcases because of what happened last time. What, me overhyping it? <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it. It had uh -huh. plenty of games I was interested in. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the Xbox showcase might be a good showcase to watch if you're into PlayStation. <laughs> That's what Christopher uh. Dring said, and he had to delete his tweet. Yeah. He had to delete his tweet. Because, like, you know... But honestly, a lot of the games that... A lot of the games they do show at the Xbox Showcase are multi-platform, and a lot of the games that show at the PlayStation Showcases are often multi-platform. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anything about PlayStation specifically. The reason I tweeted about it being Showcase season is because I keep getting offers to visit studios to show up to preview their next game. And um, it's, like, it's, like, hard to fit it all in. Hmm. We got uh, Lee Sanders says that Star Wars Outlaw price. Damn. Guessing after we learned about the Spider-Man license deal, that Star Wars deal must be similar. You think that full edition is just too much? That's just, no, that's just normally how Ubisoft prices their, their like full editions of games. Like Assassin's Creed, I believe is the same price. I think Avatar was the same price. Granted, that's also an IP, license IP. But normally that is the price of those like ultimate editions that Ubisoft puts out, which is why it's almost a better deal to just subscribe to Ubisoft plus for whatever amount it is to be it. Cause they give you the best version and you subscribe for a month. The, the kicker is remember remembering to cancel, you know, you like you subscribe, you play the game and then you got to make sure you cancel. Right. Mm. Uh, Hugh says, howdy, gentlemen. If you could both start your life from scratch, do you think you would still be doing what you're doing now? If not, what do you think you would be doing instead? Oh, that is a loaded question. If I, if, I hadn't, if, I, if I could retain my knowledge of what I know now, I honestly, like, I think I might have gone harder into learning animation, you know, mm. and I was talking about it, animation earlier. I was really into it. Yeah, I made tons of cartoons, and I had, like, I was quite... You know, I had, I had I used to get fan mail. You know, back Excuse in the day me? when I, yeah, I used to get fan mail as a kid. I was like my, my my cartoons had an email on. You could email me. I used to get fan mail before the, before the, and um, the kids would say like they they were playing my games while they were at school. You know, in the IT department and stuff. So I used to make these games like um, where you press you just press a button and something happens. You know, like kill kill a stick man. You know. In various ways, use a chainsaw. Use, you know, they're pre pretty nasty games, I suppose. They're supposed to be comedic, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, I I think I would have gone harder into that. But I honestly like my school environment taught me not to believe in myself. I was like, there's no way I could be like a, a do animation for a job. I I need to work in an office. I really feel like my school taught us not to dream. And it was only after like getting out of school and honestly hitting rock bottom where it kind of felt like, well, I got nothing left to lose. Let's try. I got nothing to lose. Let's try something else. Mm. You know, so maybe I will be doing something else. Maybe I'll be working in the game industry as an animator or something. That'd be cool. 
I don't know what I'd be doing. I mean, there's always that question of like, hey, what would you, if you could go back in time and tell your younger self, like, what would you tell your younger self? Would you still want to pursue the things that you pursued? Would you change? I don't know. That's a good question. Like, what would you want? I mean, because I like doing YouTube. Maybe I would have been like a, started doing YouTube you, even earlier than, than I did, you know? Or You're really tall. You could have been a WWE wrestler. I'm not that tall. I'm only six foot two. That's tall, man. Did you ever do? Did you ever do um, backyard wrestling? No, I never did backyard wrestling. Oh, we used to do backyard wrestling. That was really, really fun and really stupid. I mean, and, I guess uh, it. Maybe I would have tried harder in college. Because I got really good grades grades in high school, and I was in a lot of honors courses for a lot of stuff. And then I just didn't try in college. Mm. And maybe I would have tried harder. And who knows where I would be there. I don't know. It, it, there's definitely worlds out there where I am not doing this podcast and I'm not gaming. Where my life splinters off and, you know, different points to do different things, you know. And I would love to see, like, to see the variety of things I, I, I could have done if I just made different decisions or done different things. Yeah, you, maybe it would ruin me if I saw that, right? Maybe you you could have done something with that business degree you've got. I don't have a business degree. Oh, that's what you did. No. Uh, we got John Brown. John Brown said it best in chat. I'd worry less and just go for it. Yeah, that is true. We got uh Joaquin says, "Rand, here's my Patreon question. You guys are now in the Oasis. What's your avatar? What car do you drive? And name your three weapons." I'm a space ghost. I drive the Akira bike, and my three weapons are the Halo pistol, the BFG, and Excalibur. Hmm. What the hell? What does it mean, the Oasis? The Oasis yeah, is from Ready, Ready Player One. It's basically like you put on a VR helmet, and you're actually there. It's like a it's a, it's a, a huge it's like its own created world, um, like a brain dance from Cyberpunk. I oh, wouldn't know. I that. mean, I wouldn't you know, but essentially, that, like, so you you plug you plug in, and it's you know, it's this huge world where everybody plugs in. It's like the, the in the book, it's like everybody go, everybody uses this headset, and, and they go into the Oasis. It's like the biggest MMO thing in history. Um, okay. and you have an avatar, so it's like, and you have like a, a vehicle, so it's like, what would your avatar be? I would be, I would be a low poly zombie from Resident Evil One. <laughs> <laughs> I would be I would be Hadrian Marlowe, the Sun Eater from the Sun Eater series. That my avatar That's would be so uh black uh, black hair down to my shoulders with uh black uh pants and like a black you know, like shirt or whatever. Got like, stuck. Um I I'd I'd use a meme avatar. Can you use meme avatars? You can use well, yeah, you could use whatever. I'd use um, some of them you I'd, have to I'd, buy. I'd, I'd like, so, some of them have I'd, to cost money. Yeah. I'd be Sonic or something. Mm, okay. Got, got to go fast. Probably would have to buy that. What car would yeah. I drive? I'd drive a, a hearse. I'd drive the Batmobile. Batmobile. Yeah, yeah. I'd get a Batmobile. And yeah. my weapons? Hmm. <laughs> Guerrero, Shelly, and chat says emo rant. <laughs> emo rant? Hey, man, Hadrian Marlowe. Emo you know rant. what I'm saying? He's definitely... Yeah. I wouldn't say he's emo, but... Uh, three weapons... Um, uh, I'd have the one power from Wheel of Time. That's that's a weapon, right? I would have. Mm -hmm. I would have this huge sword from Highlander. Oh, you know, and interesting. Let's just go with the axe from God of War. I don't know the Leviathan axe. Le uh, yeah, Leviathan axe. I don't I know. I would, I would go with the Redeemer from Unreal Tournament. Uh huh. You ever use the Redeemer? No, it's been I, a long time since I played Unreal. It's basically, basically a nuclear missile launcher. <laughs> uh, um, I'd go with the Redeemer, and I'd go with, um, hmm, uh, uh, I don't know. I really like all the guns. From Wolfenstein, I love how the guns feel in Wolfenstein. Like they're just these ridiculous, 
like the shotguns and stuff. I love shotguns. Maybe I'd have the the most overpowered gun in history, the Nasher from Gears. You know, for your close close quarters combat, and then maybe the Mazamoon, uh, Atana from Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, the thing is, I got the one power, so I basically don't need the weapons I need. But what is the, what is the one power exactly? Bro, it's like magic, dude. It's like magic. It's like magic. Well, I'd have the Infinity Gauntlet then. Okay. Don Ataku. Somebody chat says portal gun. Portal gun. That'd be that'd be fun. Don Ataku says, "What up? Secretly in love with Nintendo Rand and secretly plays Walking Sims on PlayStation Jazz. <laughs> with Nintendo, yes, I will always make it about Nintendo." Picking up GeoCourcy from PlayStation that can help with the third party support weakness. Who or what position, if you have no one specifically, can Xbox poach from PlayStation or Nintendo that could help with the weakness Xbox has? Well, I don't know anybody from Nintendo. Ooh. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know anyone from Nintendo. <laughs> it'd be like, I guess the only people I know is Miyamoto. So, yeah, I would, um, I would poach. Sean Layden. Sean Layden's play, well, not at PlayStation anymore. He's not at PlayStation anymore. I would po- I would maybe even, and neither is Jim Ryan, I suppose. But I really think Microsoft needs someone who understands the European market. And Jim, could, Jim Ryan, could you imagine if does. like Jim joins Xbox as like the head of <laughs> the head of like Xbox, Xbox in Europe? In Europe? Yeah, that would be so hilarious. Um. Yeah, I would do something like that. The, the European market is something that Xbox has really failed in, I think. They need someone who really gets that market, the retail landscape, the regulatory landscape, and liaising with people there. I think that's... And also the localization issues and overcoming those issues. They need someone who's native to European Union, and um, that's what I would do, I think. My whole thing would have been like, well, it's all about games for me, and I would have tried to get in Connie Booth. But, I mean, she went to EA to help revitalize Bioware. So, I don't really know Connie who Booth. else. Connie Booth. Remember, she she got fired. Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog. Uh, not necessarily Naughty, Naughty Dog? Dog. No? No. Just she in was, general? She was oh, in okay. general. Like, what am I yeah. getting a mix up with? Yeah. I don't know. Either way. I, um, yeah, I... I want to believe that she'll be allowed to do good work at Bioware, but I just don't think EA really believes in it. I don't think EA cares. Dude, if Dragon Age e- comes EA out bad. and just bombs, whoo, Bioware, I don't know if they're going to be alive to make that Mass Effect. Yeah, uh, I agree. I gonna, agree, man. You know, I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with... Uh, what's the studio that I'm just not put out optimistic. Su- about Suicide Squad? Rocksteady. Rocksteady. Did you see yeah. all the stuff that happened with season the new season? Like people are up in our people hate that. The 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 Joker design is the worst Joker I've ever seen in my life. Do they Awful. even make it to like season three, or they just like shut it all down? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think season two is the last season. Maybe season one's the last season. God. Yeah. Let me see. We got any more here? Um. We got I Siler says the dealer gaming quit last video is ten months ago with the one ninety nine in the super chat. No uh, dealer, um, you know dealer's got some personal stuff. He's uh, essentially going, you know, doing. So I don't know if he'll be back. Uh, but you know, the we all have personal lives, and sometimes that takes precedence. Yeah. So, anyways. Jazz, that was a good show. I think we <coughs> covered everything I wanted to talk about. Yeah, it was a good show. Are you going to... So what's your plan for this upcoming week? You're going to... I'm going to a secret studio visit on Monday. Okay. And then I'm flying back on Tuesday. Okay. Maybe we can do Xbox a stream or something. Xbox 2 plus 1 on, on Wednesday or something? Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday, okay. Um, then I've got reviews I need to do and previews and all kinds and of stuff. And you're going to watch Fallout so you can talk about it... Uh, yeah, next week I will watch Fallout on the plane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Since I don't know if I can get, will you find out yeah. if that Vonnegut game that was canceled because the studio shut down? It's kind of weird that whole studio situation is like, I'm shutting down the studio because this unpublished article is about to come out. So instead of addressing well, the article, can... I'm just shutting down the studio. 
I can tell you right now, someone reached out to me and told me that's bullshit. So, as if it wasn't obvious enough. What what's bullshit? So, like that him... it was shut down because of the leak. It wasn't shut down because of the leak. Oh, so it's sh- it shut down because of other things, obviously, right? Other things. Yeah. Yeah, but it was, was it was or something like that. I don't know. But you think it was definitely the Xbox game, or at least what you and Grub had heard of as Project Vonnegut? I think, I think it was the Xbox game. Yeah. All right. So thank you guys so much for hanging with us for these uh, four hours. We appreciate and love every single one of you. Uh, if you're watching this later on Spotify and iTunes, make sure you uh, leave us a rating, five stars, one star. Leave us comments. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button and subscribe. All that good stuff. We will be back next week, hopefully, with an Xbox 2 Plus One on Wednesday. And then, if not, we'll be back Friday on April 19th for episode 312 of the Xbox 2 Podcast. So, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Watch some Fallout. Let me know what you think. Let let me and Jez know. And, you know, keep it gaming. Later. Rock and roll, baby.